All right, you're ready to go. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to uh, Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Legislative Committee. And uh, I'm Senator Jim Dill, the chair. We have uh, uh, three or four things to go over today uh, for uh, issues and bills. But first, we'll start with introductions, and I will start with Representative Schofield. Good morning, Senator Dill. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Schofield, and I represent House District 112. I live in the town of Weld, and I represent 17 towns and townships in Franklin and Somerset counties, the snowy high peaks of Maine. Senator Black. Good morning, Senator Black from Wilton, representing Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec, Belgrade, Mount Vernon, Fayette, and Vianna. Randy Hall, Representative. Good morning, uh, Representative Randy Hall from Wilton, uh, representing District 114, uh, six towns in Southern Franklin County. Representative Landry. Good morning, thank you, Senator Dill. Representative Scott Landry, representing District 113, Farmington and New Sharon, the rest of Franklin County. Senator Maxman. Hi there, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, which is all of Lincoln County, except for Dresden, plus Washington and Windsor. Representative Osher. Hi, I'm Lori Osher. I represent District 123. That's the majority of Orno, the home of the University of Maine. Representative McRae. Yes, good morning, folks. Thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, I'm Dave McRae. I live in snowy Fort Fairfield up in the center of Roostick County, uh, representing the good people of District 148. Good morning. I think probably today, most of us are snowy places, but- uh... That's what I understand, yes. <laughs> I, may, I, might, I might add that I may be in and out. I've got two or three committees with testimonies. So I, if, you, if you see me gone, I'll be back if I can get here. Thank okay. you. Thank you. House Chair O'Neill. Good morning. Um, my name is Maggie O'Neill and I represent House District 15, which is in Saco. And same deal, I'm on call for a public hearing, so I might have to step out for a minute or two. Representative Pluker. Thank you very much. I'm Bill Pluker. I represent House District 95, which is Warren Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. And my public hearing is right here. Representative Underwood. I'm Representative Joseph Underwood from District 147. And it's good to see everybody this morning and I'm in transit to the session tomorrow. And we'll be staying, we'll be listening in on the conversation with the committee okay. for the duration. Thank you. Great, thank you. And as I said, I'm uh, Jim Dill, I'm the Senate chair and I represent Senate district number five, which is Northern Penobscot County. Our clerk is Cheryl McGowan. And our analyst is Karen Netto. I think that's everybody that's here. So we do have uh, two public hearings and a work session today. And remember to please mute yourselves um, so there's not a lot of background or noise and you can unmute when, we're, when you're called upon to speak. Um, the chat box is to be used just for information, not to actually chat back and forth for attendees, et cetera. And please be respectful of all people as we are asking questions and answering questions today. And uh, with that, we will go right into our first public hearing, which is LD 219, an act to enhance the agricultural marketing loan fund by establishing a variable or interest rate for our loans and to allow participants in the main farms for the future program to borrow at that rate. And that's all the time we had for the session today with that title. So anyway, with that, uh, Representative Pluker. <laughs> I didn't pick the title, it was the department <laughs> picked the title, their fault. <laughs> okay. Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill, I won't repeat the title, but thank you so much for the chance to present LD219. Um, this is a department bill, and so they'll be coming up to give you most of the details on it, but I just want to give a brief uh, high and kind of look at it. The original purpose of LD219 was to update the interest rate of the Agricultural Marketing Loan Fund. 
which is the AMLF. And so the complicated part of this, about this bill is we have to remember that there are two loan funds we're discussing. One is the AMLF and one is the ADG. And the ADG is the Agricultural Development Grant. And the way the law currently exists, the interest from the AMLF funds the ADG. And we're gonna fix that. The reason we're gonna, uh, the AMLF is a revolving loan fund that provides financing to help main agricultural businesses undertake projects to enhance the viability and vitality of farms and to improve the manufacturing, marketability, and production of farm products. However, DACF's internal assessment of the AMLF revealed a notable decline in the loan funds utilization over the past 10 years due to a high interest rate that was not competitive with what farmers could get from banks. The rate is currently in law at 5%. And once we pass this bill, it will be no more than 2%. And because the AMLF fund wasn't being utilized, there was no funding being passed through to the ADG fund. Now remember the interest from the AMLF fund would go to fund the ADG fund. The ADG fund is, was a very popular program that has regularly funds. It's, right now it's currently capped at $250,000, but they would regularly have requests for over a million dollars of, of funding from that fund or requests from that fund. Uh, the bill separates the two funds and creates a separate funding mechanism for the ADG grant through the general fund. We're going to ask AFA for $750,000 annually as there are regular requests, uh, as I said, because they've so much is requested through the years. In addition to creating a better interest rate for the MLF fund, we're also going to open up the eligibility of the expenses that the funds can be used for. So more expenses, farm agricultural related expenses are eligible for use for the fund. And then we're also gonna, the re, right now, you, if you're getting money from the fund, you need to match it with 25% of your own money. And we're gonna reduce that to 10%. The intent of these funds is to get money into the hands of farmers efficiently and effectively so they can build the agricultural economy of Maine. They've been operating by old rules that are hindering farmers getting access and using these funds. This bill updates the rules, the funding mechanisms and criteria for eligibility so they can continue doing the valuable work they were created to do, build stronger, more creative farms, provide opportunities in our agricultural sector and feed the people of Maine. Thank you very much. I can answer some kind of broad questions, but I suggest most of the detailed questions go to the department. Uh, Representative Landry. Uh, thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, Representative Fluker, is this a rework of the bill we discussed previously? This bill was carried over from last yeah. session because they wanted to, they were seeing that there was additional tweaks they wanted to do to it. So a little different than we originally saw it last year. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Representative Pluker? Thank you for your presentation, Representative. And I will turn to uh, Nancy McBrady from the department. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Nancy McBrady. I'm the Director of the Bureau of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Resources for the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I am speaking in support of LD 219, an act to enhance the Agricultural Marketing Loan Fund by establishing a variable interest rate for loans and to allow participants in the Maine Farms for the Future program to borrow at that rate. What a title, I'm sorry about that. We thank Representative Fluker for sponsoring this bill. The original purpose of LD 219 was to update the interest rate of the Agricultural Marketing Loan Fund, which I'll call now in shorthand, AMLF. We wanted this interest rate to change to make the AMLF program more competitive. Following further review, however, the department requested that LD 219 be carried over to allow additional time to conduct a thorough evaluation of the sustainability of the AMLF and the related Agricultural Development Grant or ADG program. ADG is funded through the interest of the AMLF's revolving loan fund. This testimony will provide an overview of our proposed amendment to the original bill. The AMLF is a revolving loan fund that provides financing to help main agricultural businesses undertake projects to enhance the viability and vitality of farms and improve the manufacturing, marketability, and production of farm products. However, 
the ACF's internal assessment of the AMLF revealed a notable decline in the loan funds utilization over the past 10 years. This decline negatively impacts the overall sustainability of this fund. Furthermore, AMLF's interest rate, interest earned, excuse me, does not keep up with the demand for ADG grants because of the decrease in its utilization. The ADG is an annual grant program that the department offers that helps provide cost share grants to conduct market promotion, market research and development, value added processing, and new technology demonstration projects. The ADG is very popular and applicant demand always exceeds the $250,000 annual cap on that grant. Please note that the AMLF and the ADG are both very different from the recent funding opportunities provided to agricultural producers due to federal <laughs> pandemic funding. I wanna be clear that the CARES Act and the American Rescue Fund plans administered by the Mills administration have been designed as one-time grant opportunities for Maine agriculture. Whereas these two programs were established in 1996 and 1999 respectively, and were intended to be long-standing funding mechanisms for our agricultural producers. If you folks are following along with my testimony, you will see a very basic graphic, but hopefully it really underscores how these two things are set up. On the left, you have the Agricultural Marketing Loan Fund, AMLF, and its interests, which underwrites and sustains the Agricultural Development Grant or the ADG. Just wanted to make it very clear. It is a bit of an alphabet soup here. The department wanted to further examine the AMLF and the ADG programs in a manner that focused on stakeholder financial needs and compatibility within Maine's funding landscape. We held a roundtable discussion on August 12, 2021 with several financial lending experts in Maine to solicit ideas about improving the AMLF to refine its scope, maximize its impact, and complement the current mix of agriculture-specific financial instruments in Maine. The attendees are listed in the footnote. Roundtable findings indicated that while the AMLF is relevant, it is not competitive or sustainable as currently structured. To make the AMLF a more competitive offering, participants suggested lowering its interest rate, expanding the fund's scope to match current needs, and reevaluating re aspects that may pose barriers for prospective borrowers, such as contribution requirements. Decoupling the AMLF and the ADG and establishing a new and independent permanent funding stream for the ADG was also recommended as the most productive path forward. As a result of our assessment, the department requests that LD219 be amended to do the following. Separate the ADG from the AMLF. This popular grant program requires permanent consistent funding that is not contingent upon the performance of the AMLF. We request the legislature approve dedicated annual funding of $750,000 to support the ADG. As a reminder, right now, it's capped at $250,000. LD219 will also make the rules governing the ADG routine technical instead of major substantive. The program's rules outline the grant application process and re review criteria. We don't believe that they rise to the level of major substantive rules, and also note that the AMLFs own rules are routine technical. Our second request is to make the AMLF program more accessible and competitive. We've adjusted, we propose adjusting the scope of eligible expense categories to now include climate related projects, land acquisition for new farmers and irrigation water resources. We want to increase the percent coverage provided for loans over $200,000 from 75 to 90% in order to decrease the contribution burden for borrowers from 25 to 10%. We want to reduce the interest rate for the loans to the federal prime rate on the date of loan commitment, but not be greater than 5%. As a note, this is exactly the same rate for the Potato Marketing Loan Fund approved by the legislature just one year ago. And we will also allow for existing loan holders under AMLF to refinance at that new rate. Finally, we would also adjust the existing interest rate for Farms for the Future participants to match that similar change to be the federal prime rate on the date of loan commitments, but not greater than 2%. 
The consequence of not passing this bill likely means sporadic as opposed to annual issuance of ADG grants. Relying on the AMLF to accrue enough interest could result in irregular calls for ADG proposals. Our bill offers to stabilize funding for the ADG by no longer having it rely on the AMLF's performance. Moreover, our bill will significantly increase the amount of grant funding available to the agricultural community. The department is currently limited, as I've said before, to making $250,000 in grants per year. However, in 2021 alone, we received over a million dollar in grant requests. Permanently funding the ADG at hopefully $750,000 a year through LD219 would be a remarkable boost to our producer community seeking marketing and technical assistance. Further, not passing LD219 means that the AMLF program continues to languish with its non-competitive interest rates. The high level of capital investment necessary in agricultural businesses, coupled with the level of risk perceived by traditional lenders about agricultural investments, makes having accessible capital for our ag producers all the more critical. By lowering the AMLF's interest rates, expanding its scope, and decreasing the contribution burden on borrowers, the AMLF, we believe, will have higher utilization and be far more relevant to the needs of Maine agriculture. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions now and at work session. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. The next three up to testify in favor are Donald Flannery, Ellen Griswold, and Eric Venturini. And while Cheryl's letting those folks in, I will ask Representative Bernard to introduce herself. Thank you very much, Senator Dill. And I apologize to everyone. I was in my other committee and we tend, we are meeting at the same day on the same time. So I find that a bit challenging. In any event, um, good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Bernard. I represent District 149, which is part of the Crown of Maine. And that's Caribou, Westmanland, and New Sweden. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll start out with our testimonies in favor. Remember, I will time you for three minutes, at which time I will ask you to finish up in two or three sentences, and I will be keeping the timer here. Um, with that, our first person is Don Flannery. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and other members of the committee. Uh, nice to see you all again, even though it's through the screen. Uh, it is snowy throughout most of Rooster County. I drove up this morning and it was interesting. So, uh, but uh, I would like to, to speak today. I didn't submit written testimony, uh, but I listened closely to what uh, Director McBrady had, uh, had shared with you. And uh, she referred to the P uh, Potato Market Improvement Fund uh, that you passed a year ago, <clears throat> where we addressed the interest rate uh, and set it at prime at the date of commitment. Uh, it is the right thing to do. Uh, we worked a number of years uh, until we were finally successful in getting the Potato Market Improvement Fund changed. Uh, since then, we hadn't had a loan in that program for three years, maybe almost four years. One reason, and one reason only, and that's because the interest rate was 5%, and that was not attractive to anybody looking to uh, invest in, uh, in facilities. Uh, since the rate has been changed, there's one loan that has been committed to, and as of the last couple of weeks talking with staff here uh, and talking with growers, I suspect you'll see probably at least two more, if not three more loan applications through that program uh, within the next year. Uh, so I think that's a direct reflection on lowering that interest rate from the 5% down to the uh, prime at the uh, date of closing. So I think that's a, a very positive thing. And uh, I think this committee should really consider that. Uh, is it will make a difference. Uh, I support the concepts uh, Nancy laid out as to opening the program up to make sure it covers all things that may be needed by agriculture. Uh, it is very important that that happens. And if you want the AMLF loan, this is a personal thought of mine, that if you want to have the AMLF, AL, ALMF uh, program uh, to continue to be successful, lowering the interest rate is one thing that will help, but keeping the interest in the fund will also help that program grow in the future. The PMIF program, uh, the reason it grew the way it did and has funding in that program is because the interest rate, the interest paid by the growers back to that program remained in the fund 
there again to be loaned out uh, to other growers. So that concept I think is extremely important uh, rather than taking that interest and uh, putting it into the ag development grant. So we do support it. Uh, I think you'll see that there will be interest in the fund once that those changes are made. And I would gladly answer any questions that anyone may have. Are there any questions for Mr. Flannery? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is Ellen Griswold. Good morning. Great, thank you. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. Um, my name is Ellen Griswold and I'm testifying today on behalf of Maine Farmland Trust in support of the changes being proposed for LD 219. Um, MFT is a member powered statewide organization that works to protect farmland, support farmers and advance the future of farming. MFT believes that to support Maine's rural economic development, farms must be economically viable. Over the years, MFT has collaborated with farmers, food businesses, and economic development organizations to establish enterprises and deliver a range of programs and services focused on establishing a vibrant and resilient agricultural sector and food system in Maine. In our work, we have seen how Maine farmers need improved processing infrastructure and other innovative opportunities across all agricultural sectors to increase the supply of Maine grown products and to create new market opportunities for local farms. There is enormous growth potential for the food sector in Maine and the sectors that support it like farming. In fact, Governor Mills' 10-year economic development strategy identifies the food sector in Maine as one of the four areas most ripe for economic development. But investment in market and infrastructure development is a necessary first step to growing this important segment of Maine's economy. This type of investment will also be necessary to meet the state's new climate action plan strategy of increasing the amount of food consumed in Maine from state food producers from 10% to 20% by 2025 and 30% by 2030. The changes proposed for LD219 would help to provide this needed investment to realize these important goals. The Agricultural Development Grant Program is an incredibly popular program, as you've heard, for farmers to obtain cost share grants for market development, value-added processing projects, and new technology demonstration projects. Providing $750,000 of consistent, dedicated annual funding for the program will allow more farmers to engage, engage in these critical initiatives. Similarly, the structural changes proposed for the Agricultural Marketing Loan Fund Program including reducing the match burden for borrowers to 10% and providing the same interest rate as the potato marketing loan fund will ensure that more farmers are able to take advantage of this important financing. MS MFT is also very supportive of the expansion of the types of projects that can receive AMLF funding to include climate related and irrigation projects and land acquisition for new farmers. An important recommendation also included in the new climate action plan is to provide farmers with greater support to build soil health through increased financial, technical, and research assistance. Expanding the AMLF program to include support for climate-related projects is an important step towards providing this greater support. In addition, in our work, we are frequently confronted with the challenges that farmers, especially new farmers, face in affording and accessing the land they need to grow thriving businesses. The expansion of AMLF to include land acquisition will help to address this important need. For all these reasons, MFT hopes that you will support the proposed changes to LD219 and support the growth of Maine's agriculture sector and all of the economic and climate benefits it provides. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you. Next is Eric Venturini. Good morning. Good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you all again. Um, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and esteemed members of the Committee on Ag Conservation and Forestry. My name is Eric Venturini, and I'm the Executive Director of the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine. And I'm here to testify in support of the department's proposed amendment to LD 219. The Wild Blueberry Commission works on behalf of Maine's 485 wild blueberry farmers and businesses who grow wild blueberries on approximately 40,000 acres across the state. In 2021, Maine produced more than 100 million pounds of wild blueberries, representing over 10% of all blueberry production in North America. 
The Water Blueberry Commission in Maine recognizes as one of our four long-term priorities for this industry, the need to improve the economic viability of Maine wild blueberry production by one, growing demand for wild blueberries, two, building and promoting the Maine wild blueberry brand through differentiation and diversification, and three, stopping the loss of small farms and acreage. I commend the department <clears throat> for their work to improve this bill. The changes to LD219 the DACF have presented will improve the economic viability of not only Maine wild blueberry producers, but all other sectors of Maine's agricultural community. Over the last two years, the Ag Development Grant, ADG, has funded projects to expand uh, access to cold storage, wholesale packaging and distribution networks, to offer Maine farmland trust business planning programs to producers, uh, the business of farming, including one particularly tailored to wild blueberries, which helps farmers access new markets and build resilience to market fluctuations to boost profitability, to grow the Maine wild blueberry sparkling wine category through st strategic marketing, promotion and sales, and distribution in eight national markets and three international markets, to develop nutrient-loaded biochar pellets using Maine-produced biomass to improve wild blueberry production with implications for drought resistance, and to increase market connectivity of Maine wild blueberry producers by encouraging and incentivizing adoption and testing two web-based marketing platforms for wild blueberry producers. Every one of these projects has had a direct and positive impact on producers of Maine wild blueberries and has helped bring the Maine wild blueberry industry to where it is now, on the cusp of growth, driving for innovation and increasing prosperity for family farms. And yet, as we heard from DACF, many excellent applications, projects to help drive growth and prosperity on Maine's 7,600 farms, including 485 wild blueberry farms, went unfunded. The ADG is popular because of its funding targets and the simplicity of the application process that make it more accessible to more farmers. DACF is suggesting tripling the size of this program, which we strongly support. The department also acknowledges the declining utilization of the Ag Marketing Loan Fund, AMLF, and suggests several measures to make that program more accessible and competitive. These measures include an expanded and updated scope that includes, among other things, irrigation water resources. The United States Department of Agriculture, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, offers programs which are available to main producers to sustainably develop water sources, to update inefficient irrigation systems and to install new efficient irrigation systems. These funding sources go underutilized in an era when efficient irrigation systems can increase the climate resiliency of Maine farms. And they go underutilized because NRCS funding covers only a percentage of project costs, which decreases the accessibility to funding for especially large projects, which irrigation projects typically are. And B, if an NRCS funded water source project does not meet the flow rate requirements in the farm's irrigation management plan, the farmer must eat the cost of the entire pro project, which introduces a high level of risk. Under the proposed expanded scope of AMLF, irrigation and water source development projects would be more accessible to, to more Maine farmers, helping to mitigate the impacts of drought and increase climate resiliency on Maine farms. Eric, can you finish up in two or three sentences, please? I certainly can. Uh, thanks for your patience, Senator Doe. Um, in short, I fully support what the department is proposing and urge you all to support it as well. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, to present this testimony, I'd be, of course, open to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right. Again, thank you for your testimony this morning. Cheryl, that's all I have on my list to testify. Do you have anyone else? I do not. All right. With that, I will close the hearing on LD219. And we'll move on to our next public hearing, um, which is LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. And this is presented by Representative Grohowski. She's is on her way. All right. We do have uh, about 15 or 16 people to testify on this, mostly are in favor with a couple or against. So we'll do a few in favor and then we'll go over and do one against just so that uh, we'll flip flop back and forth a little bit. So with that, 
Representative, good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you. Great to be here with you all. Um, I am Representative Nicole Grahowski. I serve House District 132, which is the city of Ellsworth and the town of Trenton. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say I hope you um, have an opportunity to open up uh, the testimony I submitted through the portal just because there are a couple um, things to look at there, a little small piece of eye candy and, and a list of, in, of all the places we're about to talk about that I won't read through, um, but you might want to look at. So um, please feel welcome to follow along. Um, Greetings, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and honorable members of the Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I appreciate the opportunity to share my support this morning for LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. So what is the ecological reserve system? You may not know the system by that name, but you may recognize and love its component parts. Here they are listed by county, all 19 and 96,000 acres of them. And if you're following along, maybe you see some in your county, uh, maybe you see some that you visited, and maybe you see that there are some counties that don't have uh, any eco reserves at this time. Just yesterday, I realized that some of the Donnell Pond Reserve in Hancock County where I live is along the North shore of Spring River Lake. Okay, so what you're asking, uh, two months into the pandemic, I joined a friend for a paddling adventure to navigate Tunk Stream from its source of Spring River Lake to the sea in Steuben. As we pushed off from the boat launch, the view across the lake was stunning. A completely unmarred shoreline and mountains beckoned us toward the outlet. Many boaters were trying their luck fishing on the lake and enjoying time together in the fresh air, free for the time being from worry. And as we rounded a bend to exit this scene, we startled a moose, which lumbered off into what I now know was an ecological reserve. The adventure continued through rapids, around a waterfall, in meandering wetlands, and eventually to the ocean. When we biked back to our cars to round out the day, this was the view across the lake to the reserve. And I've included that picture for you to see. It was completely uh, peaceful and quiet and calm and the perfect end to an adventure and at that moment, the perfect respite from the uncertainty and chaos of an upside down world. The ecological reserve system was created in the year 2000 by the legislature acting at the recommendation of a broad multi-year stakeholder process. Ecological reserve is defined in statute as an area owned or leased by the state under the jurisdiction of the Bureau designated by the director for the purpose of maintaining one or more natural community types or native ecosystem types in a natural condition and range of variation and contributing to the protection of Maine's biological diversity. And it's managed for three uh, reasons, um, as a benchmark against which biological and environmental change may be measured, to protect sufficient habitat for those species whose habitat needs are unlikely to be met on lands managed for other purposes, or as a site for ongoing scientific research, long-term environmental monitoring, and education. Our current ecological reserves are functioning as intended, fertile grounds for research by University of Maine students, the Maine Natural Areas Program, and others. It remains well understood to this day that there are scientific, recreational, and cultural benefits to protecting certain lands in Maine from high impact activities. The system was intended to include representative samples of all native ecosystems in Maine to allow for study and protection of biodiversity. Think of the ecological reserve system like Noah's Ark, a way to save just enough of everything that is special for the future. So far, we have assured many of these places safe passage on our ship but there are other ecosystems in Maine that are not yet included, and there is no more room on our ark due to statutory limits. We're gonna need a bigger boat. So to discuss some of those shortcomings in statutes, um, <clears throat> I've put together some information here. It, uh, current statute limits the ecological reserve system in a number of ways. When it was written over 20 years ago, forest product stakeholders were concerned that the conversion of public lands from operable timberlands to inoperable forests would disrupt their businesses. This was a reasonable concern given that it was a new idea at the time. Now we know that this has not been the case. The limits of decades ago are arbitrary, do not actually protect our forest economy and are preventing the ecological reserve system from reaching the desired outcome of preserving some of everything. 
so I put together some fun facts for y'all. I hope you think they're fun. <laughs> some are more fun than others. Um, ecological reserves on public lands account for less than 1% of land in Maine. The largest reserve is Namakanta, which is less than 20% of the size of Ellsworth. It contains a 333 year old Northern white cedar and a 410 year old red spruce. The world famous Appalachian Trail bisects that property. The smallest reserve is Wasatacook Stream in Penobscot County at 775 acres. Small but mighty, it is in the shadow of Baxter State Park and surrounded by national monuments. Ecological reserves store roughly 30% more above ground carbon than other lands in Maine on a per acre basis. Uh, you'll also want to note that the Bureau of Parks and Lands revenue is generated by its timber harvest operations. Thus, it has no incentive to put too many acres of land into ecological reserve status or it would bankrupt itself. The Bureau of Parks and Lands must calculate a sustainable harvest limit for which harvest is below growth. For the operable land acreage under BPL management, that number of cords per year is more than what is permitted by statute at this time. It's a separate section of statute. Uh, and what is permitted by statute is well above what BPL has harvested in 14 of the past 15 years. So the ecological reserve system is not a limiting factor in BPL's harvest volume. Market fluctuations are the biggest driver of harvest volume on BPL lands, and I would argue probably across the entire state. Uh, the Forest Opportunity Roadmap for Maine in 2018 reports that there is a significant opportunity for increased use of softwoods, most notably the spruce fir, fir resource. Currently, there are more than 3 million tons of potential spruce fir available with further increases possible in the future, meaning there is plenty of wood to go around. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, walk you through the bill structure quickly um, because I'm the first person to speak on this bill, so I think it's helpful to discuss how it was drafted for you. <clears throat> the first part removes obsolete language about the origins of the system and strengthens the public process if BPL were to propose that a parcel of land be removed from the system. BPL must provide info to this committee to review, which this committee can act on through legislation. Currently, there are no requirements for BPL to remove a parcel from the system, although there are requirements for how a parcel becomes part of the system. The allowed uses, uses subsection rephrases the older language to use the active voice per the recommendation of OPA. Um, additionally, it allows Wabanaki people to gather materials for traditional uses as one of the low impact activities permitted on the land. Other allowed activities include scientific research, education, hiking, camping, skiing, hunting, fishing, and trapping. There is no change to subsections on allowed trails and roads for motorized vehicle use and incompatible uses, specifically logging, mining, and excavation, nor are there changes to the final section on reporting requirements in this bill. Uh, the subsection on research, resource protection permits BPL to use certain wildfire suppression tactics to protect the integrity of the landscape at the request of BPL. And now you're wondering, what about that bigger boat that I talked about? Uh, the last subsection removes three arbitrary limits to the system, two of which are redundant to each other at this point, and one of which is overly complex for what it is trying to achieve. Uh, I won't drag you through the math on that one, although I can at a later time if you'd like. Uh, and hope that BPL and others won't have to keep going through it either. Additionally, the bill increases the threshold of operable timberland acres on public lands that can be designated as ecological reserves from 6% to 8%. That would allow the Bureau to designate an additional 8,580 acres of their current land holding as reserves. This type of limit is maintained to prevent the Bureau from outstripping its revenue generation needs or significantly dec decreasing the amount of timber entering the market from public lands. That acreage would allow one preserve, reserve, excuse me, smaller than the Bigelow's or the Mahoosics, or maybe two smaller than average reserves to be added to the system at the time. So we're not talking about a very huge amount of land here, uh, but it is land that is very special. So in conclusion, uh, the ecological reserve system began as a vision to protect Maine's biodiversity and allow us to study landscape change. Many of the reserves have become beloved hubs for recreation and support our outdoor recreation and tourism economy. 
The utility of the system is now well established, well understood, and ripe for refinement. Some, but not all, ecosystems are included, such as northern hardwood forest and cedar swamps in northern Maine, or large forest blocks in southern Maine. This bill would allow us to finish the job. Ecological reserves are more than just a system of parcels scattered throughout the state. They are in the very lifeblood of Maine, of its people, its flora and fauna, its long history. They are what connect our past to our future. They are where we can go to find quiet, to learn, to adventure, to be in the wild. And similarly, they are invaluable to the many other species that we share this great state with. I hope you will support this bill to enhance our ecological reserve system for the benefit of generations to come. Thank you for your time this morning and consideration of my testimony, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have now or through following up later. Thank you. Other questions from Senator Plucar. Uh, thank you, Ms. Senator Dill. Uh, Representative Grahowski, am I right in understanding there's approximately 96,000 acres currently in the ecological reserve system and your bill would add 8,500? So That's, uh, I think that would be the, um, the, the simplest way to explain it. I, because of the percents as opposed to a fixed amount over time, if the Bureau were to uh, increase its overall land holdings, then the amount that they could add at a future time would be added. But as of this date, um, that is the amount of additional land they could add from the 6% to the 8% change. And then the other caps, um, like there's a cap in there that is... Uh, 15% or 100,000 acres, those numbers are actually almost identical. 15% is 103,000 acres. So that's a redundancy I was talking about. So there are a couple things in the way that we thought that something that was based on um, change over time, as opposed to uh, numbers from 20 years ago would make more sense um, for BPL to be able to um, you know, adjust in the future without having to always come back to this committee and be like, oh, Things have changed and we're up against another arbitrary cap. So that is that is what that um, percent difference is. Hope that answers your question. There's gonna, a little space in there right now. So this that would be the addition on top of the little bit of space that exists now. So cur currently it's 96,000. They have space to go to 100,000. We're giving them an extra couple percent, which if they took that couple percent now, that's 8,500. But if the total 100% if the total number were to increase, they could increase it more than that. Am I saying what you said to me correctly? Yes, and the actual most important cap they're up against now, I believe is the 6% cap. There's about just a little shy of 3,000 acres based on that cap that's available. Um, so this would take that 3,000 and add the 8,000 on top of it. Um, there's some sort of uh, additional math around whether or not the land came into the system through a donation that required it be an equal reserve. So that hundred that we're not as close to the hundred thousand as it looks like by looking at ninety six thousand. That makes sense. There's more wiggle room on that cap than the one that we're looking to adjust. I'm going to stop asking about math. Right? <laughs> Happy to do a private uh, math session anytime, as I'm sure with the director as well. Senator Black, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Bowski for presenting. Um, could you tell me um, how your bill uh, lines up with the comprehensive study that this committee did in 2016 that that uh, Senator Hickman and Senate, former Senator um, Saviel um, chaired? But they, they had recommendations in that, uh, I believe, uh, that probably address some of this. Uh, have, you, have you looked at that and, you know? Um, you know, I have read probably 50 or 100 pages of different documents, um, some that have been more recently published, like from the Bureau of Parks and Lands. I can go back and try to look at that and, and refresh my memory, but I, um, you know, wasn't serving at that time. And certainly there was a different group of people at this table. Um, so, I can take a look and get back to you on uh, what they recommended and how that compares. But right now I'm not in a position to, uh, to, to jog my memory through what is I think now older material compared to where we've been um, and the research that's happened since that time. 
Are there other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Next is Andy Cutco from the Department of ACF. Welcome. Good morning. It is still morning, just barely. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I'm Andy Cutco, the Director of the Bureau of Parks and Lands. And I'm testifying today in support of LD 736, which amends MRSA Title 12, Section 1805, the statute pertaining to ecological reserves on public lands. LD 736 makes a number of beneficial changes to the existing statute. The bill requires additional review and justification for any substantive reductions in ecological reserves, and it enables compatible traditional uses by main tribes. It eliminates, as you've heard, the 100,000 acre cap on ecological reserves, which is a fixed number based on the Bureau's ownership more than 20 years ago, and it eliminates the 15% overall acreage cap. The bill revises the cap on operable acres from 6% to 8%. And just to clarify here, operable acres are those capable of supporting forest management. So operable acres don't include things like open wetlands, cliffs, or mountaintops. We do have one suggested change to the bill language. Uh, the existing statute states that the designation of ecological, ecological reserves, quote, may not result in a decline in the volume of timber harvested on land under the jurisdiction of the Bureau, unquote. We agree, agree with the bill sponsors that this language is problematic. Many factors affect the Bureau's timber harvesting, including operable acreage, weather, timber markets, and the availability of logging contractors. As a result, the correlation of timber harvest volumes directly to ecological reserve designation is subjective. Instead of deleting the language, as the bill suggests, we recommend clarifying it as follows. The designation, and quote, the designation of land as an ecological reserve may not result in a decline in the sustainable harvest level on land under the jurisdiction of the Bureau to less than the average annual harvest for the preceding 10 years, unquote. The sustainable harvest level is the amount that can be harvested without reducing timber inventory over time. It's based on just two objective factors, the operable acres and the rate of timber growth, and it's not affected by weather, markets, or contractor availability. As background and context, the Bureau of Parks and Lands currently manages approximately 97,000 acres of ecological reserves. I think you heard 96. Our number is technically 97023. Um, on a land base of just over 635,000 acres. The bulk of the Bureau's reserves were established more than 20 years ago, according to statute, for three purposes, as you've heard, to protect habitat for species that prefer older intact forests, to serve as benchmarks for long-term monitoring, and to provide sites for education and research. More recently, we've documented that ecological reserves play an important role in taking carbon out of the atmosphere with the forest serving as a landscape scale sponge. On average, main ecological reserves store roughly 30% more carbon per acre than managed forests and those 97,000 acres capture the carbon equivalent to the emissions of uh, roughly 7,500 cars each year. Ecological reserves complement the Bureau's exemplary managed forest land, which carries above average stocking and saw timber that tends to end up as stored carbon in long lasting forest products. I personally have a long history of working on Maine's ecological reserves, and I can assure you that in addition to their outstanding biological diversity and climate resilience values, many of the state's ecological reserves are also treasured places for remote recreation, such as the Bigelow Range and the Namakanta and Dubuli public lands. As a director of the Bureau of Parks and Lands, I'm responsible for ensuring the Bureau has a sustainable source of revenue. As you know, all the recreational improvements, stewardship obligations, long-term ecological monitoring, and personnel costs of public land staff are funded principally by timber revenues. Consequently, it's essential to balance the need to expand ecological reserves with the Bureau's need to fund increasing recreational demands, cover operating expenses, provide forest products to local economies, and demonstrate sound silviculture. In considering the benefits of expanded ecological reserves, it may be prudent to also consider a dedicated funding stream to monitor and manage these, these reserves 
as a supplement to the timber revenue that is vital in maintaining public lands for outdoor recreation, wildlife, and public access. As the committee considers the bill, uh, please note that Title 12, Section 1805 currently allows the acquisition of future reserves with no acreage cap restrictions, as long as those reserves are acquired with a commitment ensuring management of that land as a reserve. Nothing in this proposed legislation will change that, and in alignment with the Maine Won't Wait, the uh, state's climate plan, the Bureau's land acquisition strategies include both working forest and ecological reserves. In summary, uh, the department supports LD 736, but we recommend editing the language regarding impacts on timber harvest so that it is clearer and less subjective. I'd be glad to answer any questions. And I should say, by the way, that um, in response to Representative Pluker's questions, I agree with the math from Representative Grohoski. So I think she's got that right. Uh, there is a lot of math here, and I'd be happy to walk you through any of that too, if there are questions there. Representative Pluker. I guess I might be asking again about math. <clears throat> Hopefully I won't get as confused. So, so, but basically, so if we were to do the amendment you're discussing here, what would that, what would the impact of that be on the math? How, how would that limit things or, yeah. In the, in the short term, Rep, uh, Representative Grohoski's numbers were, were correct. It would allow us to add uh, about 11,000 acres of um, ecological reserves. Uh, and that includes, we're roughly 3,000 acres under the cap now, uh, and plus another 8,000 give or take, uh, that this would allow us to add immediately. Uh, more importantly, by changing this to a, a percentage or a proportion, as opposed to a fixed number, it would allow the ecological reserves to grow in the future, but to do so in a way that we feel is balanced with our need to harvest timber uh, and uh, sustain our revenue and provide uh, wood for the timber economy. Follow up, Mr. Duff? Yes. Uh, the so, but specifically to your to your recommended amendment change, how would that change what we're looking at here in terms of adding to the ecological reserves? It essentially just clarifies the existing language. So there is existing language in the statute that says ecological reserves will not result in a decreased uh, timber harvest. Um, our harvest, just for example, has declined significantly in the last two years below average. Uh, largely because of the pandemic, the explosion of the J-Mill, uh, timber markets, contractor availability, all of those things. So our, um, our harvested acres has declined, but it really had nothing to do with ecological reserves. Uh, so all of this, uh, what this language is intended to do is to, uh, is to ensure another uh, floor, essentially, that, that protects us in terms of our timber revenue but do it in a way that's much more um, objective tied to the sustainable harvest level, which is just related to two factors, the operable acres and our, and our growth rates. Um, it, it would not interfere with the 8% the number, but would allow another, uh, a, 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 again, just a safety valve that made sure that we had the revenue uh, to manage and operate our lands. Okay. Okay. The question, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So in terms of hard numbers, do we have an idea of what this would limit us to? Right now, the 8% would be significantly more limiting than the sustainable harvest language. Uh, the tens of thousands of acres we could conceivably um, add to the system under the sustainable harvest language alone. So the 8% is the more restrictive number. Great, thank you. So just following up with that, <clears throat> if we pass this bill and the Bureau of Public Lands never added another acre of land to their holdings, then basically you'd be limited to only adding another 11,000 acres of eco ecological reserve land to your holdings. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Director Cutco for being here and thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around um, what can be done on that land. Uh, you know, we've uh, the sponsor mentions several things uh, and I'm, I'm 
visualizing uh, when we were, and maybe we can use Bigelow for, you know, as a, a um, something that I'm familiar with being there with you and, and on the tour and stuff and talking about the, the reserve land there. Um, what, what traditional uses would be limited from that? And uh, uh, you've already said that it's not gonna affect your sustainable harvest, uh, but what other uses would be, I know there was roads and there was trails and was hunting and all kinds of things. Could you just give me a brief summary of what would change on some of those lands? Sure, ecological reserves, and, and a lot of these factors are, are covered under the existing allowable uses uh, terms and the, the existing statute. And uh, the, the only piece there that is proposed to change um, is clarifying uh, some uses by, by main tribes. Um, otherwise, what's allowed is uh, public uh, access hunting and fishing. Uh, non-motorized trails, there are motorized trails, snowmobile and ATV trails that are allowed under a set of criteria uh, that are spelled out uh, in statute. Um, timber harvesting is generally not allowed, uh, although there is, some, there is some provisionary language to allow for uh, sanitation harvest in, in the case of a severe insect outbreak that may affect adjacent lands. Uh, in the 20 years of, of history in, in ecological reserves, that language um, allowing for the sanitation uh, harvest has not been uh, exercised. So I, I don't see that as a major factor, but basically public access exists, uh, non-motorized trails exist, motorized trails can exist under certain circumstances um, and hunting and fishing is allowed. Thank you, Director. So uh, with that uh, sanitation cut uh, path, um, so if we had, um, a severe outbreak of, um, you know, uh, spruce budworm, you know, in a large section of one like Bigelow somewhere. I'm, I'm, and I'm not sure Bigelow has that larger stand of uh, fur and spruce, but uh, if we did and it was severe and needed to be removed, or if we had a um, severe hurricane windstorm type of deal that flattened couple thousand acres, you know, and, and cause created fire hazard situation, would we be able to go in there and clean up that harvest on that type of situation? And in, in a situation like what you've described, Senator Black, I would, I would carry those questions to, we have a pretty robust scientific advisory committee, uh, which uh, consists of folks like uh, uh, Dr. Mac Hunter, who you just uh, nominated to the LMF board, uh, and a number of other scientists from across the state, I would carry those questions forward. Um, my, my own sense and inclination is that uh, spruce budworm and uh, wind and weather are natural events and ecological reserves are set up to be essentially a, a laboratory where we can study and examine the, the impacts of natural events on habitat and on our native species. Um, so I, I, again, I'd carry that question forward, but that's the nature of discussion that would likely occur is what are the types of events? Um, is it spruce budworm, which is a native insect, um, or is it the hemlock woolly adelgid or emerald ash borer, which are non-native um, and might invoke some, some different uh, thinking and different strategies? Thank you. Uh, there are other questions. Representative Landry. Uh, thank you, Senator Dill. I'm sorry, you probably touched on it. I lost my connection for a bit during that last conversation. Uh, in adding land to the ecological reserves, supposing you had a piece of land with recreational vehicle trails, ATVs, snowmobiles, is that would that change? Would we purchase those properties or put those into an ecological reserve and stop the trails? That's a good question, uh, Representative Landry, and, and the existing statute does discuss uh, their criteria uh, for when uh, existing motorized trails can continue. Um, I don't have those memorized, but essentially it has to do with whether or not it's a through trail from uh, point A to point B, 
you know, a pre-existing trail, et cetera. So there are accommodations that can be made for motorized trails, yes. Thank you very much. Other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you. Okay, our next three um, folks speaking in favor are Andrew Whitman, Anya Fetcher, and Beth Ahern. So with that, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Andy Whitman. I am uh, Director of Applied Sciences at Manomet, a conservation organization that applies science and engages people uh, to sustain our world. I personally work with foresters, farmers in Maine and across North America to support their efforts at achieving sustainable working lands. This means improving conservation of natural lands as we're talking about today, but also means while at the same time increasing conservation and, and productivity on working lands elsewhere. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. Maine's remarkable for being one of the first states in the country to create an ecological reserve system. People from Maine's environmental community, our hunting and fishing community, and the forest products industry all recognized the need for an ecological reserve system decades ago. It is often forgotten that the Maine forest products industry played a key role in the development of ecological reserve network despite its concerns about the possible impacts for the forest products industry. But all stakeholders rallied around the fact that it's too much to expect private landowners to support ecological reserves on their lands. The overall goal of ecological reserves was to include representative areas of all habitat types found in Maine. Unfortunately, this goal, as it's already been pointed out, has not been met. The ecological reserve system still lacks many common habitat types found in Southern Maine, even some common habitats found in Northern Maine, such as spruce fir flats are not well represented in the ecological reserve system. Thus, the system is incomplete. So why are reserves important? Why are we having this discussion? Well, ecological reserves foremost conserve the ecological legacies, a key part of Maine's natural heritage, part of our common heritage as Mainers, and one to bestow on our children and our grandchildren. This includes a limited number of rare species, populations of which are best secured on natural lands. Once common habitats and ecological conditions rarely found elsewhere in, the main, in Maine. They are also areas for scientific research which serve as scientific reference points for understanding environmental change. With climate change and other large scale changes, this need has become even more pressing. The ecological reserve system helps us make better sense of ongoing large scale changes in our state and understand what, if any, responses are necessary. Finally, reserves have supported recreation. They have been designed to permit rec recreation and continue to be used by Mainers. So why should we expand the ecological reserve network? This bill in, uh, aims to increase the cap on area of ecological reserves to 8% of operable acres, which would allow the network to expand by about a little over 8,000 acres has already been discussed. These added acres would fill gaps and better meet the needs to conserve ecological legacies and our heritage, understand and address environmental change by providing, uh, providing new um, uh, areas of study and continue to provide recreation. This bill allows the Bureau of Parks and Lands to slightly expand the ecological reserve network to better achieve all these objectives for all Mainers. In its 20 year history, the reserve system has not adversely affect BPL's wood harvesting or wood supply. In fact, BPL commendably has done an exemplary job at managing the land for multiple purposes, balancing the needs of, of different stakeholder groups that it serves. Can you finish up in a sentence or two, please? Certainly. So with that, I urge this committee to support the bill and expand the cap on Maine's ecological reserves. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and I'm happy to take any questions. Other questions? Okay. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Whitman for your testimony. I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, why reserves are important just so I can understand um, the 
the ecological benefit, the benefit for habitat, stuff like that? Uh, certainly, um, Representative O'Neill. Um, I think actually, to be honest, uh, Representative Grohowski really expressed it well in terms of thinking of, about these as uh, lifeboats or part of NOAA's a collection of NOAA arcs in terms of there are species actually, uh, and some of which are kind of admittedly obscure species, species that have actually disappeared from other states in New England that thankfully we'll, we still keep. Part of it is our land use history. And, um, and part of it is we have a, a system of, of really gems of, of ecological reserves that are well suited for, for keeping those species. These are mostly, like I said, obscure species, um, uh, lichens, mosses, um, fungi, um, but otherwise are actually have disappeared largely from Eastern North America. We are, Maine is sort of a, a lifeboat uh, for these species and these the ecological network is specifically a life, lifeboat for those. Um, and so uh, that's why one of the key reasons, the other point is, is a scientific reference point. As the world changes, we need places that don't change or that change only in response to sort of background change. Um, and so that helps us understand that as we manage our forests, as we change our landscapes to meet human needs that are so important, that we have these reference areas to understand what are the long-term impacts of those, those changes and to guide those changes in a way that are more sustainable, um, not just for the environment, for, but for making Maine a, a livable um, and desirable place to live. Thank you. Are uh, there other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Um, I don't see uh, Anya. Cheryl, was she? She is not in the waiting room. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, next is Beth Ahern, followed by Christian Shorn. David, sorry if I butcher your last name, Publicover and uh, Dana Duran. Thank you, Senator. Good morning. Senator Dale, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry Committee. My name is Beth Hearn, and I offer testimony on behalf of the Environmental Priorities Coalition in support of an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. The EPC is a partnership of 37 conservation, environmental and public health organizations who unify around a common agenda every year the EPC represents over 120,000 members in Maine who want to protect the good health, good jobs, and quality of life that depend upon a healthy environment. LD 736 is one of the priority bills for our coalition this year. And thank you to Representative Grohowski for sponsoring this legislation. Enacting 736 would accomplish two very important objectives. Number one, protect and enhance Maine's biodiversity. And number two, help Maine's climate goals by achieving carbon neutrality by 2045 and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 80% by 2050. Maine's ecological reserve system was created in 2000 by the legislature to maintain one or more natural community types or na native ecosystem types and natural condition and range of variety of variation and contribute to the protection of Maine's biological diversity as a benchmark against which biological and environmental change may be measured, as a site for ongoing scientific research, long-term environmental monitoring and education, and to protect sufficient habitat for those species whose habitat needs are unlikely to be met on land managed for other purposes. And I got that right from the, um, the law. State-owned ecological reserves, number 19 in total, covering less than 1% of the state, yet they protect some of Maine's most iconic and spectacular landscape, as Re Representative Grohusky said, the Bigelows, the Cutler Coast, the Mahusics, Mount Abraham, Namakanta, and the Tunk Lake Donald Pond Preserve. The total acreage of these res reserves is 96,000 acres. Yet again, the statutory goal of protecting all ecosystem types has not yet been achieved. There's the current gap of 100,000 acres on these reserves that has been effect, that has effectively prevented the goal from being reached and has no scientific justification. LD 736 would allow the state to acquire more ecological reserve land and meet the purpose of the original legislation. As you've heard, Maine's biodiversity is at risk. The Maine Climate Council Scientific and Technical Subcommittee 
on climate change and its effect, uh, uh, Maine describes climate change as already having a dramatic effect on biodiversity. Approximately one third of the 442 plants and animals in 21 habitats in the state are affected by climate change related threats. This threat is likely to get worse before it gets better. And the best tool we have to maintain biodiversity is to ensure a network of biologically and geographically diverse lands that are well connected so that plants and animals can move across the landscape to feed and breed. Enacting 736 will help Maine meet its climate change goals through nature-based carbon sequ sequestration and storage. On average, ecological reserves store 30% more carbon than other lands in Maine on a per acre basis. Expanding ecological reserves is a critical step to meeting the state's climate goals, specifically to conserve 30% of Maine land by 2030, according to the Maine Won't Wait 2020 Climate Action Plan. Conserving natural lands maximizes their potential to draw back carbon from the atmosphere and to achieve the state's goals of achieving carbon neutrality by 2045. For these reasons, please vote ought to pass on this important piece of legislation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Okay, Christian, you're next. Thank you. Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Chris Shorn, and I am the Senior Stewardship Manager for Midcoast Conservancy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of LD 736. As a land trust and conservation organization operating in the watersheds of the Sheepscot River, Madamic River, and Damariscotta Lake, our organization is here today to add our voices in support of this important bill to enhance Maine's ecological reserve system. As a 1,700 member accredited land trust, we steward over 14,000 acres of land conserved in perpetuity in Midcoast Maine. Our mission is to protect all vital lands and waters on a scale that matters and to inspire wonder and action on behalf of all species in the earth. We envision a world where our lands and waters are healthy and protected and where nature occupies a place of central importance in every person's life. Simply put, the work we do across our service area means nothing unless it is considered in the greater scale of conserved land across our state. The ecological connectivity we strive to foster across our watersheds will die without corresponding connectivity beyond our borders. The acres of healthy lands and waters we conserve represents only a drop in the bucket of Maine's 35,000 square miles. And the biodiversity we protect in our Midcoast community represents only a small subset of the astounding natural heritage that Maine has to offer, which characterizes our beautiful state, powers our outdoor recreation industries, and draws thousands to Maine each year. The ecological reserve system in Maine has done an ad admirable job of preserving beautiful places and important examples of our natural heritage. But as Aldo Leopold, one of the founding fathers of conservation ethics, once said, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the parts. As sea level rises, the global temperature warms, invasive species swarm our native landscapes and development increases, we need to act to save all the parts of our native landscape and so build an ecological infrastructure that is diverse, dynamic, and resilient. This bill would address that by expanding our state's ecological reserve system, capturing valuable and rare habitat types currently unprotected in southern Maine, growing existing reserve blocks and setting the state on a track to meet the climate goals set forth in our climate action plan. We additionally add our voices to those of our colleagues at Maine Audubon, among others, for the committee to consider eliminating or raising all limits on ecological reserves, including increasing the cap on viable ecological reserves from 8% of BPL's operable timberland to 10%. Climate change will have and is having incredible and far reaching effects on our native landscapes and now is the time for ambitious action rather than conservative measures. Passing LD 736 is a critical step in building the conserved landscape network that our native biodiversity depends on, and I therefore urge the committee to vote ought to pass on LD 736. Thank you so much for your time and consideration today. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Great, thank you. David, you're next. Thank you, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee. My name is David Publicover. I'm Senior Staff Scientist and Assistant Director of Research for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And the AMC strongly supports this legislation. The AMC is the nation's oldest conservation and recreation organization with 6,500 members in Maine. 
We own 75,000 acres of forest land in Piscataquis County, which is managed for multiple uses, including sustainable forestry. But nearly 28,000 acres of our ownership, about 38%, is maintained as permanent ecological reserves consistent with the MBPL system. I've been engaged in discussions on ecological reserves in Maine since the early 1990s. I served on the Maine Forest Biodiversity Project Scientific Advisory Panel and have served on the Natural Areas Program Ecologic Reserve Scientific Advisory Committee since its inception in 2001. The legislature and the Park, Maine Bureau of Parks and Lands deserve great credit for establishing an ecologic reserve system that can serve as a model for other states. However, it's important to recognize that the original legislation represented a significant compromise from the potential identified in a 1998 inventory of potential reserves on Maine's public and private conservation lands conducted by the Maine Forest Biodiversity Project. And this compromise was necessitated by the need to maintain BPL's operable timber base that provides the, their primary source of funding. Now, 20 years later, the value of and need for an expanded ecological reserve system is greater than ever. The threats from both climate change and the loss and degradation of natural habitats across the globe continue to increase. Ecologic reserves are one of our best tools to address these threats. In addition to protecting rare elements of biodiversity, reserves also serve as areas where larger expanses of unfragmented mature or late successional forest can be restored and maintained. And this is a habitat that is very limited in Maine's North Woods. They also serve as a significant natural carbon solution. While managed forests have a, a significant role to play, protecting existing stocks of mature forests and maximizing additional on-site carbon storage is best achieved in areas reserved from harvesting. This value was recognized by the Maine Forest Carbon Task Force, which recommended quote, establish forest reserves on sites with high carbon density and in areas of special ecological value to allow the stand to mature to a late successional forest. For these reasons, we support LD 736, which would increase the cap on the amount of operable timberland that may be included in reserves from 6% to 8% of the Bureau's operable timberland base. However, we believe that the cap should be raised to 10%. A recent financial analysis conducted by the Bureau indicated that this level should not adversely affect the Bureau's ability to maintain the harvest levels that have been achieved over the last decade. And I would note that we would also support uh, the proposed amendment uh, regarding their harvest levels uh, proposed by Director Cutco. Uh, we also support the provision to allow members of indigenous tribes to collect traditional materials within reserves, a use that AMC allows on our own land. In conclusion, we urge you to pass LD 736. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to comment on this legislation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I have submitted more detailed written testimony. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Other questions? Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Thank you for thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Public Over. I. Uh, I recently read a study that old growth uh, forests were less advantageous for carbon sequestration than managed forests that were in the uh, 15 to 20 or 30 year range out from being after being managed. Uh, because, because the growth the growth slows so dramatically as the uh, as the overstory gets of that age on it. Could and I'm I'm fully in favor of all of this. What we're talking about, I think it's important to do this. But I saw the question when we talk about sequestration, carbon sequestration, that old growth forests may be uh, more advantageous than uh, those that are well managed. So I'm, I'm just wondering about that particular question. If you could reply to that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's, that's a question that's been discussed for a long time. Uh, and it, it has to do with the difference between sequestration, which is the rate at which carbon is being accumulated, which is much higher in younger forests. 
Uh, forests tend to go through a period of rapid growth from maybe 20 to 80 years old, at which point they slow down. But older forests uh, and the difference between sequestration, which is the rate, and storage, which is the amount of carbon that is stored, and old forests have much higher levels of carbon storage, even if at some point after several centuries, they may more or less plateau, in which the release of carbon from decomposition equals the rate of carbon storage from photosynthesis. So, the, But the important point is when you have an old forest, you want to maintain it. If you cut down that forest uh, with the goal of increasing the rate of carbon storage in the younger forest, you're going to lose so much carbon in the process of harvesting and, and decomposition and slash that it'll take you decades, if not centuries, to, ca to catch up to where you already were. You know, I use an analogy. Imagine you have two cars going down a highway. One of them is going constantly at 60 miles an hour. The other one accelerates to 60 miles an hour and stops, then accelerates to 60 miles an hour and stops. The, the, the second car will have a much higher rate of acceleration, but the first car will get there sooner. Because again, when you stop and slow down, which would be equivalent to a harvesting, it takes you a long time to catch up to where you already were. Uh, so maintaining old forests is far preferable to, than to cutting them down and replacing them with younger, faster growing forests from a carbon storage perspective. Thank you for that, appreciate it, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, Representative Schofield asked one of my questions because it was about, it was just going to be about the differences between um, sequestration and storage um, in mature forests. So I'll ask my second one, which was, um, uh, I just wanted to get an idea of, of other benefits of maintaining mature forest um, that you measured. Well, <clears throat> mature forest and yeah, mature forest and especially low, late successional forest is a really critical habitat that is the preferred habitat for uh, many species. Uh, we don't have really any old growth dependent species here like the spotted owl in the Pacific Northwest. You know, if we did, they would have been eliminated a long time ago. Uh, so both young forests and old forests uh, have uh, high, high levels of biodiversity. Middle age forests, which is much uh, where most of our forest is managed, uh, really is, is in some ways kind of a biodiversity trough. Uh, <clears throat> and across the North Woods, because of the, you know, the extensive presence of, of commercial harvesting, uh, old patch, you know, significant patches of old forest are recognized as a, a fairly limiting habitat and, and it have been for more than 30 years back to the time when John Hagen uh, of Manomet was doing uh, initial studies on bird species and different types of habitats. Uh, so both young forest and old forest have great biodiversity value, but it's old forest that is really limiting uh, in the North Woods because it simply doesn't pay to let the stand of trees grow to be 200 years old. Uh, and, and that's a value that reserves can serve is, is helping to increase the supply of uh, an important habitat that is really limited, limiting for uh, uh, across the landscape. Thank you. Other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, uh, speaking against the legislation is Dana Duran. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Dana Duran. And I'm the executive director of the Professional Logging Contractors of Maine. PLC is a trade association uh, that was created in 1995 to represent independent logging and, and trucking contractors in the state. Um, as of 2017, logging and trucking contractors in Maine employed over 3,900 people directly and were indirectly responsible for the creation of another 5,400 jobs. This employment and investments that contractors make contribute 620 million annually to the state's economy. Uh, our membership includes over 200 contractor members and an additional 100 associate members that employ about 2,500 individuals and are responsible for 80% of Maine's annual timber harvest. And uh, secondarily, 
The majority of them are those who work on Maine's public lands and also harvest and transport uh, forest products from public lands. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify on behalf of our membership in opposition to LD 736. We did not come to the decision to oppose the legislation without reservation, but since this legis legislation was not provided to stakeholders until this past Friday, only three days ago, uh, prior to the public hearing and almost a year and a half after the bill was, was referred to the committee as a concept draft, we can't support the approach in this legislation at this time to expand the ecological reserves. As this committee knows, the revenue that funds the uh, public lands division is derived completely from timber harvesting revenue. Timber harvesting uh, revenue not only provides the Bureau with operational revenue, but employment and economic activity throughout rural Maine. Currently, the Bureau of Parks and Lands manages about 600,000 acres of the land in the state. 96,000 have already been uh, placed in an ecological reserve. Um, for specifically why we're opposed, and this is a very good example, um, there was no prior discussion with stakeholder groups uh, with respect to why this legislation was necessary. It didn't bring any stakeholders together. There were no prior discussions with groups um, that had a stake in this. So we had a little bit of confusion over the bill language. Uh, we estimate that if this is uh, limited to 8% of the operable land, you could actually expand it by 41,000 acres and not the 8,000 acres that Director Cutco mentioned. But I think that just speaks to the confusion that we had with what this is trying to do and the lack of discussion that's taken place with other stakeholders leading up to this. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm a member of the Climate Council's Natural and Working Land subgroup that began in 2019. I've been a member of the Governor's Forest Carbon Task Force, which began meeting in early 2021. And we also had a member on the 2015 Commission to Study the Public Reserve Lands. In not one, one of those groups was there a discussion about expanding specifically Maine's public reserve lands for ecological reserves. I would say that, you know, we've done a really good job having stakeholder discussions. And if this was a, a, a outcome, then it should have been discussed at some point with a long-term goal. It seems like the legislation was put together um, by a group that, that didn't want to include all the stakeholder groups. And we have concerns over that. I would recommend a different approach. And that is bring a stakeholder group, have a resolve that comes out of this committee which asks that for public participation and come back in the next legislative session with some recommendations on what should be done um, and make sure that it doesn't have a negative impact upon our industry. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and I appreciate you uh, listening to, to me today. Thank you, uh, Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dana, for your testimony. Um, I believe you might've been part of the 2000, I think it was 2016 um, study that we did out of this committee uh, on public lands. How does this, do you remember or recall how this lines up with that study? Yeah, a uh, good question, Senator Black. So I was not, uh, I was not specifically on that commission. I did speak and testify in front of that commission. We had a member of ours, Tony Madden, who is now the president of our organization, who was a member of that commission. Um, there was really no discussion of the econo ecological um, lands that were managed by the Bureau of Parks and Lands, other than providing data on the acreage, um, what, what is done, how they're managed, what are the allowable uses, et cetera. But uh, there were no recommendations specifically uh, with respect to ecological reserves that were managed by uh, the Bureau at that point in time that were in the list of recommendations. And I think there were, if I recall, there were 12 to 15 recommendations that came out of that group. Thank you. Representative Osher. Uh, yes, I'm on the Natural and Working Lands Group too. Hi, Dana. And, uh, and my understanding is that this was actually a recommendation of that group. Uh, uh, the recommendation of 4AII was maintain support for and consolidate uh, legislation mandates to reflect new science on climate change. So, um, so look for mitigation opportunities and landscape resiliency. So everyone except for one member of the working group supported this. So, so it, it seems to me that it's exactly what you're suggesting, which is that we should look to what the working lands group says and then put that into legislation. So I appreciate um, 
uh, Representative Rakowski bringing this forward. I, and I think we've heard some really great testimony. I, I don't understand what the, what the concern is. It's actually a very small acreage, but to do a very important, to play an important role in biodiversity and um, modeling how you would store carbon by putting some land aside for carbon storage. Uh, Representative Osher, is that, did you want me to answer that? I didn't know if that was a statement or a question. It's a statement, but the question would be, um, uh, so, so what, which, which part do you think doesn't reflect that? Because you were a part, you know, I, I joined the working lands group after you did, because I've only been a legislator for a year. I've been watching it because as a climate change scientist and someone very interested in how the forests are, as you know, can be a big part of storing carbon, which helps us, the plants are actively taking CO2 that out of the atmosphere. The majority of the land in the state is forested. So I have been you know, focused on this my whole time thinking of about Maine and carbon storage, but I wasn't on the working lands group as long as you were. So, so I want to hear what your thoughts are of how this general statement, what I just said is a, basically a general statement. Um, so, but you know, what you think uh, more needs to be said. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I would say, you know, to your point, what you made in the recommendation that was in the, the Natural and Working Lands report was a general statement, but it wasn't specific. It wasn't speci a specific recommendation of how much acreage that's under the management of the state should be moved towards ecological reserves. There were no specific recommendations of acreage under management of the Bureau and Parks and Lands that were part of that discussion or that recommendation. So I guess I would answer your question with the following. You know, we're really good at having these stakeholder groups. Um, that Natural and Working Lands Group is an example of that. The, the Governor's uh, Forest Carbon uh, Committee that I'm a part of is, a, is representative of that, of that. So I guess my question, not necessarily back to you, but kind of um, hypothetically is, why wouldn't, if, if it, there were some who decided that this was a recommendation that should be made, why wouldn't a stakeholder group of um, folks who have a stake in the management of, of lands by the state of Maine be brought together to discuss what's necessary, uh, what lands should be moved into the ecological reserves, why aren't they there now? You know, the current statute says that you can have up to 15% or 100,000 acres, whichever is less. Well, we're not at that cap yet. So if there's 4,000 acres that should be put into the ecological reserves, why hasn't it been done? We don't need this legislation to do that. And if there's further land that should be moved over, shouldn't a stakeholder group get together of interested parties that are going to be impacted, especially, you know, my members should have some type of participation and they're not the only ones and I understand that but I guess you know I, I respond by saying well, let's have a discussion and let's ha actually have some hard proof of what we're going to be doing you know this was a concept draft until three days ago so it's unbeknownst to me why we're right here now and over the last 14 months there's been no discussion with a wider group well I I can hear the concern in your voice and I um I know that your your members are are you know wanting to make sure that things aren't, aren't taken away that would help them make do their livelihood, and I understand that. And uh, maybe it's important for us to ask the staff for a full the full set of re recommendations from the Nat Natural Working Lands Group to see where this fits in. As far as the acreage, whether it's acreage or anything else, there's you know social science as when there's diminishing amount of resources that people get be much more careful. And so I appreciate those who have been looking at putting um, land into these kind of reserves. And as they approach that, the, the, the limit of what's been put into the statute, and as uh, Representative Grubowski mentioned, there were legitimate concerns when this was put in that, help, that are what created these boundaries and these acreage caps. But we know the benefits of these reserve lands. And um, I, you know, maybe for the working lands, excuse me, for the working group, we could also hear from academics who are doing research. I certainly have gotten emails from academics in support of this uh, say, and with my connection of having been a, an academic previously and, and representing Ordo of how important the ability to study these reserves are <clears throat> for learning about forest ecosystems. So I, I just think that maybe 
uh, of the recommendations and also, uh, so I guess just think about the diminishing air amount of acreage that, that the rate in which we put things into reserve may reduce as we get towards that total number. And so this uh, suggestion of increasing the total number allows for us to look at, at more places that we can put in reserves. Just remember everybody to keep this in the form of a question. Representative Osha, were you asking uh, Karen or the clerk for our work session to have the recommendations from that working group? Yes. Okay, thank you. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that was that was what I was gonna say, that uh, the panelists should be mindful that this is a public hearing and not a work session and questions should be asked and not lecturing. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Duran, for being here today. Um, I'm curious for the work session if you have any data that you could provide with us that the ecological reserves have ne negatively affected the, the logging contractor's ability to work. I think that would be helpful in this conversation. Sure, I, I would be happy, Senator. So are you, I assume you're asking if the current ecological reserve land has had a negative impact? Yes, and it and it just it seems like we're talking about, you know, adding like a relatively speaking a, a small amount of land. And so what what impact would that have? If you have any data that could answer that question, that would be great. Would would you mind if I, I don't mean to, I'm not being flippant in any way or disrespect disrespectful. If I asked a question to your question, would it be maybe and maybe this is a suggestion, it would be helpful for me to know. Um, on the 96,000 acres that are currently part of uh, or managed as eco ecological reserves by the Bureau of Parks and Lands, what the reduction in timber harvesting was from the year 2000 to today. That would be a very helpful to me because I actually, I don't have that data um, because again, I just received this bill the other day. And so I wasn't prepared or equipped to give that answer at this point. Yeah, heard heard and understood. That sounds like a question for the department if they're listening. We'll make sure, uh, Senator, that we asked uh, Karen or Cheryl to get that information from the department for the work session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any other questions? All right, seeing none, the next, next three, thank you for your testimony this morning. The next three are Eliza Donahue, Jeffrey Ridden and Caitlin Bernard, all speaking in favor. Go ahead, uh, Eliza. Thank you, Senator Dell and Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. My name is Eliza Donahue. I'm really happy for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill on behalf of Maine Audubon and our 30,000 members and supporters. Um, we support the bill as well as the amendment um, shared by the sponsor in advance of the hearing because it's a crucial step towards conserving Maine's biodiversity and ecosystem health, as well as the state's climate goals. Um, that said, our testimony recommends a minor amendment to the bill sponsors amendment, um, which I will describe shortly. Um, you have heard uh, from folks before me uh, that climate change is already having a dramatic effect on biodiversity in Maine um, includes Maine species such as moose, Canada lynx, loons, excuse me, brook trout, Atlantic puffins. Um, you know, and as these species presence in Maine wanes, so does Maine's biodiversity and our ecological reserve system plays a really important role in maintaining biodiversity. The bill language presented to the committee by the sponsor um, serves to increase the ability of the Bureau to protect biodiversity as well as a number of other um, uh, things relative to the ecological reserve systems. And I'm gonna draw particular attention to section five of the amendment, which has already been of specific uh, discussion by the committee. So that section five would, um, and forgive me, I'm going to be re re repeating some things you've heard before, but I, I think it's, um, it's, it's worth hearing again. Um, 
Section five would exist or would update the existing cap on the system. The intention of this section is to increase the Bureau's flexibility in designating lands within the Bureau's jurisdiction as ecological reserves while preserving, and this is the really important part, an adequate amount of operable timberlands for timber management within the Bureau's land holdings to financially support the Bureau. The current statute states that no more than 6% of operable timberland acres on public lands may be designated as ecological reserves. Um, operable timberland acres is a subset of the totality of ecological reserves and of public lands. And the bill sponsors amendment would update that 6% figure to 8%. Maine Audubon recommends increasing, I believe you've heard this um, from a couple other folks, increasing that 8% figure to 10%. Um, that 10% figure would allow the Bureau to designate approximately 20,000 additional operable timberland acres as ecological reserves. Currently about 23 acres of 23,000 acres of ecological reserves are located on operable timberlands that count toward the existing statutory acreage limitations. Um, at the risk of totally confusing everyone, um, it's important to rem remember that, again, operable timberlands are a subset of the totality of, of ecological reserves and public lands. Uh, the 8% figure in the sponsor's amendment would allow the designation of approximately 14,000 additional acres um, this change is a small but really meaningful difference. Uh, I heard the beep, I'm wrapping up. Um, meaningful difference with regard to biodiversity protection and ecosystem uh, health. And the addition of a few thousand acres could make a measurable difference in increasing a couple reserves to the size that more meaningfully protects particular natural community types or link existing parcels to support habitat connectivity. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for my oral testimony. I welcome additional questions. I'm also happy to share um, that I am also a member of the Natural and Working Lands Working Group um, and, and, and welcome any questions um, on that point. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Donahue, for being here. I'm curious just if you could talk a little bit more around the process in the Natural Lands Working Group and the conversations that happen there around eco reserves, if, if you could touch on that, please. I can, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll start before by saying, while those came about just a couple of years ago, it does feel like a very long time ago. So I, I would really wanna challenge myself to go back um, and understand um, exactly what the process was. But I believe it was Representative Osher who read um, from what were the, um, what were described as kind of the strategies from that working group that were then passed along to the um, to the totality of the Climate Council or to the Climate Council for their consideration onto whether or not to include those strategies within the final climate action plan. And Representative Osher correctly um, described what, um, what the recommendation or what was described as a strategy was within those, that communication from the Working Lands Group to the Climate Council. Um, it's also notable that um, Mr. Duran, I think, was accurate in his description that um, what Representative Osher read was um, was both a, a pointed recommendation, but one that did lack um, a very specific recommendation as with regard to acreage or something like that. So I'm I'm happy that we're having this opportunity right now to talk about those specifics, to take what was a concept within the Working Lands Group and now kind of move it to a place where we can talk about real numbers, impact, et cetera. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Eliza. Uh, thank you for being here and testifying. Um, I'm struggling to understand, to put my head around all the numbers. You just mentioned some numbers and, and certain, um, you know, 
working, you know, uh, within the forest land, working forest land and stuff. For I'm not, and I'm not sure the the other, the other one to ask, but uh, I'm going to need, you know, this is something I would normally be very supportive of, but I'm struggling very hard to understand the percentage of the total and and um, um, how much we're adding. So for the work session, I would really appreciate either you or someone coming up with a good shot or some figures that we could really get our head around. Because I think uh, there's quite a few people struggling with the uh, understanding the acreages and the percentages and, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure if you can address that right now or if you could do it for the work session. Yeah, thanks. And, and I would I would definitely recommend um, that at the work session um, that Director Cutco um, really walk everyone through the numbers. They are they're really difficult. Um, and what I would specifically offer is is making sure that we distinguish between um, the totality of the size of the ecological reserves and really focus on changes to operable timberlands that could be designated as, as ecological reserves. Because I think that that's really where, uh, or I know, I don't think, I know that that's where the real tension exists. This, where the tension between wanting to grow the system, but also to maintain financial support for the Bureau and also maintain a flow of, of, um, of trees off of ecological reserves, or excuse me, or off of public lands generally. Um, so that that would be my suggestion is is to make sure that um, there's a lot of kind of bigger numbers when it comes to the ecological reserve system and and public lands and those are important but I think really what this or I would respectfully suggest that um, this committee really focus on those operable timberland acres um, when they're when they're in discussion. Thank you so much. I I would agree. Yeah. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Thank you, uh, Ms. Donahue, we appreciate you being here. Uh, just, to, just in order to confuse Senator Black even more than we have already, I, uh, and I am confused to some extent too, I have a couple of questions and perhaps it's, it's for you, but maybe we need to work at it at the work session. I'd like to know if there's ever been an inventory done of lands in the state of Maine, not just public lands, but lands, uh, that perhaps Audubon might have or some other entity might have that equate themselves to being in essence uh, what we're talking about, uh, um, ecological reserves. I'm thinking, <clears throat> for instance, that Mount Blue State Park, for instance, which is around 8,000 acres, uh, Grafton Notch State Park, uh, 3,000 acres, Camden Hill State Park, which is five or 6,000 acres, uh, in essence, are for the most part, maybe they're not ecological reserves, but they, they share a lot of the similarities and perhaps more so, more, they're more similar to ecological reserves than they are to operable public lands. And I'm just wondering if, if those numbers, in order to confuse us even more, if we could get a compilation of all that so we could kind of get a good, a good idea, a sense of what the inventory is or what we're expecting it to be. I hope that's, does that make sense? Thank you. It does, yeah. And what I um, would would recommend at the, um, at the risk of um, volunteering someone other than myself, um, I know that the Maine Natural Areas Program um, has done very similar work. You know, there's kind of capital E, ecological reserve system, you know, those within the holdings of, of the state, though, your Mount Blue example aside, but then there are uh, lands that are owned, are privately owned and are managed very similar to ecological reserves. So I think that, that um, you're right and that that is a, a good thing for um, the committee to be considering, um, you know, the role that private entities can play in, uh, in preserving um, these types of lands and then also the role uh, that the state can play. Thank Representative you. Osher. Yep. Representative Osher. Um, I, I, that's okay. I'm, I'm done. Thanks very much. Okay. Are there any other questions? 
All right, seeing none, next we have Caitlin Bernard followed by Patrick Strout, who is against, Melanie Stern and Sarah Sindo, both in favor. Caitlin. I believe that Jeff Reardon was in line ahead of me. Oh, did, it? did I skip Jeff? Oh, I'll sorry, pass Jeff. back to him if yeah. that's okay. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll go to Jeff. I just skipped over him, sorry. Thank you, Senator Dale. Um, I, I, I promise not to take it personally, uh, representative <laughs> of the committee. Uh, I'm doing much less legislative work now. This is only my second bill uh, in 2022, and both of them have been before you guys, which is not the committee I usually spend most of my time with. So I um, appreciate being here today. Um, I, I'm going to deviate a, a largely from my written testimony, A, because you have it, and B, because it's late in the hearing on this bill and you've heard most of it before from other people. Um, but I, but I wanna focus on a couple of things. Um, uh, one to start off with, and then a couple that address, I think some of the questions that are clearly gonna be the focus as you move into the, um, considering this bill in the work session. Um, first of all, there, there were some questions about the values of ecological reserves in general. Um, as you all know of me, I have trouble thinking in general. I, I see the world through glasses that only see trout and salmon and other cold water fish. So I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of ecological reserves for cold water fish um, in the past with our existing ecological reserve system and, and thinking forward into the future. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, we've, we've added about 97,000 acres of public reserve lands, and those include Bigelow, the Cutler Coast, the Mahusics, a, a bunch of others. Uh, the ones that we really think of hard, TU and, and other conservation-minded anglers, are the trout and salmon waters that were largely protected on lands that were conserved for other purposes, but include some of the real uh, jewels in the crown in the state's fisheries. And in those, I would put um, probably at the top of that list, um, the Arctic char waters in the Dabuli Reserve, which is about a third of the remaining Arctic char habitat in the state of Maine is in the Dabuli Ecological Reserve. Um, the Namakanta Reserve, which has a, a network of native brook trout ponds and streams, um, Wasada Cook, which combined with Baxter State Park, essentially makes all of Wasada Cook stream from its source on Mount Katahdin uh, down to its confluence with the East Branch of the Penobscot, um, an ecological reserve. It's a whole watershed on a big river uh, that's really critical for brook trout and Atlantic salmon. Um, and also, uh, I, I was intrigued, um, um, Representative Grahowski, um, started us off with a description of paddling down um, uh, in the Donnell Pond Ecological Reserve on Tunk Stream, and the protection of the headwaters of Tunk Stream uh, protects one of the largest intact um, systems Maine has that still supports sea run brook trout. Um, so we tend to see, you know, th th those things were, were protected on those reserves, but, but largely secondarily, as we move forward, we'd like to be maybe more proactive about thinking about aquatic habitat as we develop new ecological reserves. One of the primary reasons for that has to do with climate resilience. And uh, Dr. Public Cover uh, spoke a few speakers ago about the carbon storage side of that equation. And I will defer to him because he knows a lot more about it and actually manages lands that are selling carbon credits. So knows how to do that accounting. I wanna talk about the climate resilient side of the equation, which is that on um, lands that are not operated on, especially lands that are not operated in the riparian zone, um, it changes the habitat structure in ways that are very favorable for climate resilience um, for cold water fish. And I suspect for other species too, but the trout and salmon are what I know about. That includes large trees providing shade over headwater streams. It includes trees that fall down and die into the stream, uh, providing large woody habitat that creates pools that are where uh, brook trout and salmon will hide from predators and find cold water in the summer. It can even result in better connection between the floodplain and the stream, raising summer base flows and, and uh, lowering summer water temperatures. So we, we, those are all good things for trout and salmon. Uh, we'd like to see more of that. With respect to the bill, obviously we're strongly in favor of it. Um, we would support uh, raising the cap to 8% as proposed by the bill sponsor. You've heard testimony from some other folks who would suggest uh, taking the step now to go to 10%, not because we need that right away, but because it probably makes sense to plan for um, the foreseeable future. 
the last time we did this bill lasted us 20 years. We don't want to do an incremental change now and be back here tweaking it again uh, four or five or 10 years from now. Uh, we should really plan for, for the long-term future. Can you finish up in a couple of sentences, Jeff, yep. please? And, and, and just to wrap up, uh, I, I, I hear the confusion about the various caps and how to do the accounting for them. I will say my, my understanding, and, and I may not know this perfectly, is that um, we are approaching the existing 6% cap, so that needs to be ex ex expanded. We are also approaching the existing 100,000 acre cap, um, which frankly, we would just do away with. That was created at a time when we had a lot fewer public lands and the percentage cap seems to us to be the way to go as the amount of public lands probably continues to grow with Land for Main Future and Forest Legacy and similar type programs. Um, and so we would suggest moving to a single cap based on, you know, percentage of le leaving uh, enough operable timberland for the BPL to, to support itself and for the BPL lands to contribute to Maine's wood basket. Um, I don't know where the 15,000 acre or 15% cap came from or where we stand with respect to that. I actually think we're farther from that cap than from the other two. Uh, and agree that getting the, the Bureau to provide the um, accounting of what these various changes would mean in terms of future expansions would be very helpful to inform your discussions. And uh, apologize, I ran a little bit long. Thank you, other questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. Now, Caitlin, it is your turn. Thank you very much, Senator Jill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Caitlin Bernard, and I'm the Natural Resources Policy Advisor for the Nature Conservancy here in Maine. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. We support the bill and the amendment that was circulated with the committee and the IP list in advance of the hearing by bill sponsor, Nicole Grahowski. Um, Like Jeff, I'll, I'll sort of jump around since you've heard a lot of what's in my written testimony and you have it in front of you. Um, the Nature Conservancy is a nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all of life depends. Guided by science, we create innovative on the ground solutions to our world's toughest challenges so that the nature and people can thrive together. TNC has been leading conservation in Maine for more than 60 years and manages approximately 275,000 acres of conserved lands across the state. I'll just add personally, you know, hearing Representative Grahowski's stories made me think about all the amazing personal, you know, experiences I've had on some of these properties. I grew up in Fort Kent, so I was fortunate to be able to go to Dubully almost once a year, often more than that, um, and still visit and am very fortunate to have that in our region. I was recently with the LUPC and some of the agency staff at the Tunk Mountain. We hiked up Tunk Mountain and looked at that sort of region and the, all of the ecological reserves there. So there's lots of really amazing resources here. Um, I'll sort of skip down to um, just the six, the eight, the 10% number that's been thrown around. I won't get into the math. I'll just say that we recommend that this committee consider updating the limit. As others have said, we're, we're okay with eight. We would love to see 10. Um, so we're recommending that you consider that. And we think that that percentage is important. It's, you know, it, it, it will focus the discussion on the balance as, as Director Cutco said, needed to maintain both operable timberlands while allowing for additional flexibility in ecological reserves to accomplish some main goals. I'll also say, I don't know that it's been said yet, so I'll add nothing in this bill requires the Bureau to come to 10% or to add 20,000 acres. It, it simply allows the Bureau to do so at their own discretion. So I think, you know, we've got really incredible agency staff here and hopefully we will continue to have that into the future and, you know, they'll be able to use their own discretion. So giving them a little more cushion will just give them the ability to sort of see the opportunities that come before them and, and use that. Um, I'll just point to you, I think that um, Dr. Pelbikova puts a reference to this in the chat, but there was a recent study that was done by staff at main, key main agencies called an assessment of accomplishments and gaps in mainland conservation. I believe it's still in draft form, but I, I suspect it'll be available soon. And it's basically a comprehensive review of land conservation in Maine, guided by the 1997 report on the Land Acquisition Priorities Committee, the LAPAC report. I know that's referenced a lot in the work that I do, so I, I suspect that some of you have heard of it. Um, that report did a really thorough review of the ecological reserve systems in Maine, 
and demonstrated that some forest types, basically that report in 1997 suggested as, as Representative Grahusky said, a list of forest types and habitat types that should be sort of collected on the arc of, of protecting Maine's lands. There's a whole list of, uh, in that report of places that haven't yet been added to the ecological reserve system. And so one of the key takeaways is that ecological reserves include examples of most habitats in Maine, but there, there are a whole number of, of others that, you know, specifically blocks in Southern Maine, Northern hardwood forests, cedar swamps in Northern Maine that could still fill some gaps in the network of ecological reserves. So I'll wrap up. Um, thank you all for this long afternoon and, and all of the great questions. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any or, or bring additional materials to work session, but we support this bill and I hope that you will too. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is Patrick Straub. Well, thank you, Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill and good members of the ACF committee. My name is Patrick Straub, Executive Director of the Maine Forest Products Council. We certainly appreciate the importance of the ecological reserve system. Um, we work all around it. We're part of uh, its makeup, um, but at this point, the council can't support removal of the acreage uh, restrictions in section five because we really don't know what the overall plan is. Caitlin mentioned it and uh, Eliza did. There is a report by the Maine Natural Areas Program and, and Representative Schofield, you were getting at this, that says there's over 900,000 acres of federal and private land placed into ecological reserves in the last 25 years. And I think that the urgency of moving quickly on the Bureau of Public Lands uh, changes is tempered by this sort of dramatic increase in ecological reserves. So we're saying um, that maybe there's a better approach or a time to evaluate how BPL uh, ecological regions overlap with the statewide inventory of preserved land and we'd be willing to participate in this exercise and just see where we stand. This seems to be um, a logical approach. From my perspective and past executive directors who've been involved with the uh, Maine Biodiversity Pro Project, a removal of uh, this amount of acres from the wood basket is significant. We of course represent wood consuming mills and uh, an eight and a half billion dollar industry. So that's why we're always gonna be watching these things. Uh, other parts of the bill that uh, we submitted some comments on, changes in the section on the designation of an ecological reserve. If we're gonna talk more about the process to remove parcels from the reserve, we think a reciprocal process that provides a little bit more than just notification to the committee, but shall submit a report if a property is, is suggested for inclusion in the reserve, just sort of a reciprocal balance. Um, the section five, um, Andy Cutco got to this, our approach to thinking about how to um, establish the limits of an ecological reserve is suggested in the language that attaches the calculation to the sustainable harvest level as modeled. This is a professional way that the land um, is managed within the Bureau of Public Lands and uh, would pass um, uh, good silvicultural practices. Um, I served on, I've been appointed by the governor on the Maine Climate Council and um, uh, served on the um, Natural Lands Committee. I am the one dissenting voice on this issue for the very things that we're talking about today. Where are we going with the overall state program? How does it fit? What are the goals? Um, it's a pretty open-ended question. And um, uh, I think that's why we're, we're concerned about just moving forward. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of research on, um, on carbon sequestration in the forest. There's certainly good things about uh, old growth forests, but the actively managed forest and an intensively managed forest will certainly give us 
the best of, best of both worlds with a lot of sequestration of carbon, uh, embedded products that uh, can store carbon for hundreds of years in the houses that we own. Um, and it, never mind the huge economic uh, return from active forest management in our communities. So it's a balancing act, I realize, but uh, there are many, uh, many factors that need to be considered when we think about our carbon policy and our um, ecological reserve policy. So glad to continue the discussion, be involved in um, more, more thoughts about this issue. Thank you very much. Representative Hall. Thank you, Senator Dill, and uh, thank you, Mr. Stroud, for your testimony. I'd like to know uh, if you or your group was uh, included by the uh, sponsor of this bill in any of the of the of this bill. If you could just tell me if you guys were included in that. I felt like I got a pretty fresh copy, uh, <laughs> but it, I don't think there was a a, a lot of. Uh, I think everybody was operating at a pretty fast pace on this concept. All right, thank you. But I, I, and I have talked to some folks that were uh, supporting the bill. So I've had some level of communication that I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony this afternoon. Thank you. Melanie Sturm. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee, I'm Melanie Sturm, Forest and Wildlife Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and I'm testifying in support of LD 736, uh, as proposed to be amended by the sponsor. This bill will have significant benefits to Maine, as others have described thoroughly. Uh, Maine's ecological reserve system was created more than 21 years ago, and in that time has become a successful network of public and private lands that protect examples of some of the many habitat types and natural features found in Maine. BPL is one of a handful of entities that manage, manages eco-reserves. You've heard that uh, BPL has 19 reserves in its jurisdiction. I included a map on page four of my testimony of where those reserves are, and I also attached a new report from NRCM that features original illustrations of seven of the 19 reserves and some of the species they protect. Uh, please check that out. It's um, a nice feature publication. Uh, as proposed to be amended in by the sponsor, LD 736 would protect these special places and give BPL the opportunity to designate additional eco-reserves where habitat types are not adequately protected. It would not require that reserves be designated. New designations remain at BPL's discretion. The 20-year-old statute limits the total acreage of BPL's eco-reserves in various ways, as you've heard, these caps are not scientifically based and create an unnecessary constraint on BPL's ability to further protect important habitats. Um, Representative Grahowski's amendment would enhance the ecological reserve system for sure, although I would encourage the committee, as others have, to consider increasing the limit on operable timberlands to 10% rather than 8%. Uh, that 2% difference is uh, amounts to 6 thousand acres and as equal, uh, excuse me, as Representative Gorhowski commented, that could allow BPL to connect existing conservation lands or designate a single ecological reserve in Southern Maine where there are large undeveloped roadless blocks, but the rate of development and fragmentation in that area is pretty high. Um, LD736 would be consistent with the recommendations of the Natural Working Lands Working Group, which it sounds like you'll learn more about and with the 2019 Land Conservation Task Force. It is also in alignment with the Maine Forest Carbon Task Force, which recommended, quote, to establish forest, forest reserves on sites with high carbon density and in areas of special ecological value to allow the stand to mature to a late successional forest, unquote. That's on page eight of the Maine Forest Carbon Task Force recommendations. The sponsor's amendment will enable BPL to pursue a careful process for further expansion of the eco-reserve system. Since 2000, BPL has allowed it followed a deliberate public-facing process to designate eco-reserves as part of its planning for all management units. BPL's record speaks for itself with no controversies that we are aware of resulting from eco-reserve designations. We believe the time has come to allow BPL to increase the size of the system. 
and respectfully urge the committee to vote ought to pass. Thank you so much for your time and I'd be glad to answer questions. Well, that was good timing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions? All right, seeing none. Again, thank you for your testimony. Next is Sarah Sindo. Thank you, uh, Senator Dale, Representative O'Neill, members of the Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, Forestry Committee. My name is Sarah Sindo, and I'm here to testify in support of LD 736 as proposed to be amended by the sponsor. I work seasonally for two nonprofit organizations who operate near numerous parcels of public land. From May through October, I am the site manager at Chuankee's Big Eddy Campground on the West Branch of the Penobscot River. The campground is in close proximity to Sabumic, Jiro Island, Big Spencer, Chamberlain Lake, and Namakana. I've been at the campground for seven seasons, and I can say confidently that the attractions in the North Main Woods continue to draw more and more people. I've witnessed a new trend over the past couple of years, too. People who grew up or vacationed in the area are now bringing their children along for the ride, introducing them to water sports, hiking, and camping. There's an entire new generation falling in love with the wilderness in this area. The numbers at the campground speak volumes too. We saw over 3,100 campers this past season, which was up 20% from the previous year. During the winter season, I head to Kingfield, where I now own a home and work seasonally at Main Hudson Trails. You might know this organization has been closed for the past couple of years, but reopened last month to overnight guests. The organization operates three backcountry huts near the Bigelow Preserves, another parcel of Maine's ecological reserve system. I interact daily with prospective and current guests, and everyone is so thrilled that the huts are back open. Guests and locals rave about the land and scenery that make up the trail network and comment how special and unique it is. Folks from out of state have visited over the past few weeks and have said how much of a treat it is for them to have such an accessible introduction to a backcountry experience and that they will return. I urge you to vote in support of LD 736 because Maine's ecological reserves represent some of the most special outdoor features in Maine. Arbitrary cap of 100,000 acres on the ecological reserve system is handcuffing our ability to protect more unique natural features in Maine for future generations to enjoy. If there is one thing I have taken away from pandemic life, it's how essential outdoor spaces really are. Over the past couple of years, many of my friends here have explored new areas right in their backyards or within a short drive, discovering new trails and camping spots. It's really been wonderful to hear their stories and even put a few new destinations on my radar. The passing of LD 736 would mean so much for the state of Maine. Yes, it would aid in preventing threats from development, climate change and pollution Let's not forget the people. Getting outdoors in these ecosystems does wonders for people's mental health and outlook on life. It's a chance for people to come back to living in the present moment, to breathe in fresh wilderness air, to listen to the birds and find quietness. Thank you for your time and listening today. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions for Sarah? Seeing none, thank you. Your testimony. Uh, that was the last one I had on my list. Cheryl, is there anyone else? Anya Fetcher is now in the waiting room. Oh, okay. Let her in. Here she comes. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I missed it earlier. Thanks for letting me back in. Um, so hello, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and uh, members of the ACF committee. Um, my name is Anya Fetcher. I'm the state director of Environment Maine. We're a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization with thousands of members across the state. So I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of LD376. Or, sorry, 736. It's been a day already. Um, so others who have spoken before me have uh, already talked a lot about the, the technical aspects of the bill uh, and have listed numerous benefits um, that expanding Maine's ecological reserve system would have for both biodiversity and carbon sequestration. So my written testimony uh, is echoing that, but I want to take the opportunity to speak on a, a more personal 
uh, level. So since moving to Maine 20, uh, two and a half years ago, I have had the pleasure and privilege to explore much of the state's stunning wilderness. I've camped on the Cutler Coast, where I spent the night staring up at some of the brightest stars that I've ever seen and waking up to watch the sunrise over the water from the easternmost point of the country. I backpacked across the mountains in the Bigelow State Preserve. There I walked past marshes and bogs over networks of brightly colored fungi and found myself in forests of beech, birch, and maple one minute and spruce and fir the next. According to the DACF, these forests uh, show little evidence of past harvesting and support many trees that are over 110 years old. Uh, also in the Bigelows, I filtered water from Horns Pond to drink, ate wild blueberries at the top of Avery Peak, and watched birds and other wildlife. I recently learned that the Bigelow Preserve, which spans 3, 000, or 35,000 acres, was actually established in 1976 by referendum to prevent the development of a ski resort, which was the, results, um, or the result of, in much part, a grassroots movement. I found this really interesting as a great example of Maine people demonstrating their support for wilderness preservation over development and fast profit. There is so much value in protecting our wild places. Um, our, the ecological reserves protect some of Maine's most spectacular landscapes as well as exemplary natural features and species at risk of extinction. And so we really need to protect Maine's biodiversity while it still exists. I also wanted to take a quick moment to uh, address some of the questions about uh, forest se or carbon sequestration in old growth forests. Um, so of course, here in Maine, you know, we no longer unfortunately have what's technically called old growth forests. We have a lot of mature forests. Um, and in, basically the older the forest, the better it is at storing carbon. Um, and to quote a, an article from the Yale Climate Connections, old growth forests are like a giant bank account of carbon. They store an enormous amount of carbon in their trunks and allow even more to be stored in forest soil. Uh, although scientists long had thought old trees can no longer absorb carbon, recent studies do suggest that they continue to capture large amounts into old age. So while we don't have the old growth forest here now, we have mature growth. Um, those, you know, over 100 years old, and if we protect them now, they will become old growth and continue to store more carbon. Uh, so to sum up, the Bureau should be given the opportunity to expand the ecological reserve system in order to address the growing conservation need for protected habitats and to enhance the public values of public lands. So for these reasons, I urge the committee to vote ought to pass on LD 736 uh, with the sponsor's amendment. So thank you so much for your time and consideration. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions on you? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Cheryl, is that our last person to testify? That's the last one. All right, then I will close the public hearing on LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. We've got uh, one more agenda item, which is the milk tier program, LD 1805. And of course it could be very fast or it could be very, very slow. So what would you like to do? Would you like to take about a 15 and 20 minute break and kind of stretch and then come back and start in again? Thumbs up if you want to break. Yeah, looks like most everybody wants to take a quick break. So why don't we uh, come back, David. Editor, sorry. Uh, I've still got to get to Augusta today, so I'm probably going to take my break now and head south. So okay. we'll pick up where wherever I left off. Yeah, for me. Um, and there may there may be a vote today, just so you know, on the milk bill. Yeah, I I realize that, and I stayed as long as I dared. But. Sure, understandable. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Very Thanks. Good. Thank you. See ya. Okay, it's uh, one twenty-one. How about if we meet back at one forty-five? That will give everybody about a twenty. Five minute break and okay we'll start back at 145 thank you
Mm-hmm. Senator Dill, did you that email I sent you? Yeah, what was that? One of uh, my neighbor, he's a wood broker. He buys a lot of products, imports a lot. He just got that note from PV in Eddington. Yeah. Being killed by the Chinese. Oh, okay. Ash. The Chinese are buying all the ash logs. Ah. He wants me to do something about him. I told him I'd have you fix it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Say we need them all for baseball bats made right here in the state of Maine. So yeah. That and bat and baskets. And peavies. <laughs> That's right. Karen, I looked, but I couldn't find the actual um, tier and prices that was the recommendation. Do you have that just as a chart someplace that you can send to us? I do. Um, it's in, I pasted it into my bill analysis. Oh, but okay. I can, do you want me to send that uh, via email or email? Yeah, put it yeah because, out? yeah, because I, I mean, you can put it up, but I just like to have it up on my other screen as I'm talking about it. So as I say, it couldn't go very fast if we just say, yep, let's go here and, and vote it out or we can have a big debate over, do we try to add more? Do we try to add less, subtract? All right, 2305, 2144, et All right, uh, we have a quorum back, so we'll go ahead and get started and we'll open up the work session on LD1805. I know some of our Northern friends will not be here. They are all uh, heading towards Augusta, so we probably won't uh, see them again on the screen. Um, so with that, we'll open up the work session on LD1805, Resolve regarding legislative review of chapter 26, producer margins, a major substantive rule of the Maine Milk Commission. So Karen, would you bring us up to date on that, please? Sure. Um, so <laughs> it probably goes without saying, this is about the Maine Dairy Stabilization Program, also known as the TIER program. And this uh, program and the um, target prices in rule, um, this major substantive rule provides for direct payments to dairy farmers to sort of fill the gap between the prices that the farmers are paid for um, their product versus their actual cost to production. And as we all know, from the public hearing and from our Dairy 101 briefing, um, the Maine Milk Commission has an agreement with the University of Maine to conduct this cost of production study. So that's how they arrive at um, the target prices. And so, and as you also already know that there are um, farms are kind of categorized in four different levels uh, based on their actual, their annual production range. So um, there are corresponding target prices given 
to the farms based on how they're categorized. So um, in terms of testimony, you did receive a lot of testimony in support of the bill. And the gist of the support is that the cost of production numbers, um, otherwise known as the, the tier prices um, and the corresponding tier prices haven't been updated by the Maine legislature in almost 10 years. Uh, they haven't been updated since 2012 and supporters feel that now is the time to increase these out of date minimum prices. Um, there was no testimony in opposition and the Maine Milk Commission testified neither for nor against as they usually do. So um, Senator Dill was just asking about um, the current target prices versus what's being proposed um, by LD 1805. Of course, it's a resolve, so you're not seeing it in the bill, it's in the rule. I mean, I can go through those if you'd like me to, but um, for now, I will skip over that, the charts right in the bill analysis. Um, and I'll just say that I just wanna sort of point out what the committee's options are in terms of the resolve itself. Um, you have three options. You could pass the resolve without amendment, which would authorize the agency to finally adopt the rule as drafted. You could pass the resolve as amended to authorize the agency to finally adopt the rule if certain changes are made and you would specify those in your amended resolve. And then the third option is to pass the resolve uh, as amended to specify that the agency may not adopt the rule, which is what you did uh, three years ago with a, a similar resolve. It was LD24 in 2019. So um, because I figured that a big question about this resolve would be how much is this going to cost, I did reach out to um, your fiscal analyst over at OFPR to see if we could get a preliminary fiscal impact statement uh, in time for the work session. And I, um, you should have received that by now. And Michael is here to, to answer any questions about the fiscal note. Um, but I will say that the fiscal note says that um, the uh, proposed rule change would decrease general fund revenue by $5,781,910 in fiscal year ending 2022, and by $10,618,695 uh, in fiscal year ending 2023. And of course, there would be a corresponding increase to the other special revenue funds revenue to the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, um, Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources. So of course, um, you know, when I first reached out to Michael, he did say to kind of have a big asterisk, a big disclaimer that this is just a snapshot in time. Um, it depends on the timing. If you move forward with the resolve of, of when the resolve is finally passed and what the effective date is, and of course, um, the Revenue Forecasting Committee is meeting in March next month. So that may change numbers of general fund dollars going into the main milk pool. So, but if you, you have specific questions about that, you, you could ask Michael. But um, the final thing I wanted to, to say is that if the committee votes in opposition to the new target prices, that the bill will not go to the special the special appropriations table because the fiscal impact of the milk tier program is already baked into the revenue forecast. And then um, on the other hand, if the committee votes in support of the new target prices, the bill will go to the special appropriations table. Oh, you're on mute, Senator. Sorry, I'm new to this process. So um, if it <clears throat> does go to the appropriation table and died there because of the price tag, does it revert back to where it was and we just move on from the, the previous price that's already there? Or does it kind of throw the whole thing into, because I'm, I'm afraid that's why three years ago we didn't do anything because I think we were afraid of that that if, if we put this forward and for some reason appropriation said no to this new price, 
it through everything willy nilly. And so I just want to make sure if we vote this through, even if it doesn't go to appropriations, there's no harm done to where they currently are. And I don't know if Michael has an answer to that or Karen has an answer to that or nobody has an answer to that. Uh, and everybody's just you. smiling, so. Uh, no, I, no, I can take a stab at that if you'd like. Um, if it goes to the special appropriations table, and it likely will, and it, it doesn't pass off of, or doesn't isn't removed from the special appropriations table, the current prices are what would remain in effect. So the current transfer in the RFC would remain the same. There wouldn't be any adjustments to it. Uh, if it is passed and the new prices do take effect, the transfer will be adjusted to reflect the new prices. Okay, because I, I, I was just concerned that I, I think we're all supportive. Well, I shouldn't speak for it, but I'm supportive of, you know, certainly passing this <clears throat> and, and helping out the farmer, dairy farmers. But I just want to make sure that they remain at least as a minimum where they were. I just don't want them to get hurt any more than they are already being hurt with the price as it is. Representative Hall. <laughs> yes, thank you, Senator Dill. And that's, that's been a major concern of many dairy farmers that have talked with me about that is if, if we didn't pass, if that didn't pass through appropriations, that it would just stay the same as it was, which I think would make everyone feel much better that if, if we didn't get it approved, then it, we wouldn't, it wouldn't go away. Basically, you know, I'm no power if it doesn't get approved, but exactly. if it gets approved, it's like, hey, thumbs up by everybody. Yes, thank you. Yes, correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments, anybody has? Representative Pluker. I guess I'm also new to this. I'm not seeing my raise my hand thing. Yeah, uh, I was up. I saw it. Okay, oh, good. <laughs> the uh, question was, oh, can AFA can play with the tier numbers? So if they decide they want to give two and a half million going to five million, they then could change the 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 report from the milk commission and that's a question for you mr russo uh yeah well uh, once it moves to the bodies and it's referred by the senate to the appropriations committee it becomes their bill and they can make uh, any change they'd like to, to and they might uh confer with the milk commission to try and reduce some of the impact on some tiers or change some of the prices i i can't say what the directive would be but those are all options that could happen yes Representative Hall. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did have another question, and I'm not sure if anyone can answer it, or if, if uh, maybe we need to call in uh, Julie Marie Bickford. But it's my understanding that when this starts out, that all the farms start out as tier one, and when they meet that requirement, they bump up to tier two, and then to tier three, and then so say a large farm that is milking say a thousand cows would still start out in tier one and then just go up through the tiers? Or would they start out like with the tier that they're gonna be in in the final end? Uh, I'm not sure of that. I believe they all start at tier one. And as soon as they hit that um, goal of uh, uh, yeah, 16,790 you know, uh, hundredweight, they go to the next tier. Okay, so everyone starts out at tier one and then they right. just bump up through the tiers as they go. Right. All right. Uh, is, there, is there a reason for that? Or, or I, don't, I don't understand why it, that it goes that way. Because, I mean, everyone has their, their actual production amount that they've made for, for the whole previous year. So, I mean, we, we know, or is, is it goes on this year's production, not on past production? I guess that's, that's what it is. It does go on this year's production. And okay. I think actually... <clears throat> Representative Pluka kind of asked that question last time. Why didn't you start out in tier four? I don't remember what the answer was, but they did say they gave him an answer why you don't start out in tier four. That, that, would, make, of, that would make absolute sense if it was well, going on this year's production. Yes. Yeah, I, I think, I think, yeah, I think what it is, you start out at tier one, at least on that first 16,000 hundred yeah. weight, you get in the higher price. Then you go right. down a little bit, then you go down a little bit more. And then, you know, because yeah. we talked about economy of scale. You know, if you had 50 cattle versus 100 cattle, at some point, there's an economy that the next 50 cows doesn't cost you as much as those first 50 cows. Right, right. Because of the basic cost. Because right. of the basic investment, right. Yep. Yep. Okay, you answered my question. Thank you. 
Is Julie Marie in here? I don't know if I saw her. I, I thought she. Yes, she is. Would you like me to bring her? Yeah, in? I wanted wanted to bring her in, and and I, I don't want to steer the committee a field here by saying something incorrect. And um, yes, Bill, uh, Representative Pluker, sorry. Thanks. Uh, oh, I was wondering, is it possible because that that flow through program is one way that the cost of the program could be reduced if AFA raises concerns with it? Is it possible for the committee to kind of send some direction to them about this is one way to reduce the cost without without overburdening, reducing the burden of the program? And that might just be something that we have to do, you know, by sitting in the committee room and having the conversation with AFA directly. I didn't know if there was a if there was another format for adding that commentary to our report. Right, uh, Julie Marie. First off, have I steered them wrong with my answers? Did you hear the answer that I gave? And I did. You were correct about the flow through of the tiers. Um, the only caveat is that not every tier pays out every month. So, you know, but your pounds still move forward. So, um, for example, a tier three farm may or may not get any tier one or two funds, depending on what the price is any given month when they are in that, mm -hmm. uh, that tier. Right. Yeah, it depends on the price of them, like, like, you know, whatever the price is for that month, correct? Right, right. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and could you answer, Bill, do you want to, uh, Representative Pluker, do you want to state your question again? We kind of got off track there. Maybe Julie Marie can answer that one. I mean, I, it was basically around, can we give appropriations directions? And you've been around not only in legislature, but with the milk long enough, Julie. I don't know. I can't remember if we have given them directions in the past. We have the the problem we have is a is a, a structural administrative one in that the um, the computer program and the formulas that calculate the tier don't have an option for if you were to either assign additional money or cap a limit of money and so that would require um, individual calculations by hand on every single farm every month. Um, and it would be me that's doing that, <laughs> so. Okay. So uh, again, I guess I would ask kind of the question that, that in a different way that Bill has asked, uh, Representative Pluker has asked, um, if we send this forward just as it is, they look at that price tag of somewhere between five and $10 million. And they say, we can't go, we're not gonna go above 5 million. Um, and they decide that they want to adjust it. That's kind of the end of it and they do it and they could really mess the whole thing up. Is that? It depends, it depends how they do it. Um, I'll just give you a scenario and it's, I'll just say it's a likely scenario. So by the time appropriations gets to the special appropriations table, um, it's very likely that the revenue forecasting committee will have met again. Um, officially, the fiscal note for this bill has to be given to you using the information that was available when the revenue forecasting committee last met. And that includes the milk price forecasts from when they last met. So all the calculations that Michael has and that I have worked up are all based on what we predicted milk prices were back in November of 2021. Um, I will tell you milk prices in January, 2022 going forward look drastically different. They are significantly, milk prices are up significantly um, and that lowers the cost of the tier program dramatically, regardless of which numbers you move forward with. Okay, thank you. Karen. I'm sorry, I'm, I missed some of the discussion, um, but I wanted to phone a friend because um, 
and and perhaps OPLA and OFPR could chat about this, but the question about if the bill goes to the special appropriations table and it dies there, that is a failure of the legislature to act. And then that means the main milk commission could finally adopt the rules as proposed in um, by the resolve 1805. So I would think that people would be cognizant of what's going on and, and make the necessary changes on the appropriations table, but technically um, it's my understanding that's what happens. Uh, Karen's exactly correct. I apologize for the incorrect information. Uh, well, I, I think everybody's concern here is just from the standpoint of, you know, we just want to make sure something goes forward and, and certainly whatever that is, is not less than where they are now. And I, I, I guess that's where, um, you know, my concern is, and, I, and I'm just trying to think back three years ago, and that may be what we did because we didn't recommend it going forward. Now it may have been because of the way the budget looked then too, and it does look better and milk prices are up. So this would seem to be the time that we want to change the prices, even though it may have a very small impact this year, at least it's in place for next year if the prices, you know, fall out. So, uh, Representative Pluka, did you have your hand up? I, I was just hoping that Karen could restate that or, or Mr. Russo could restate that. <clears throat> so I, I wasn't following all the way. So I, I was just making sure, cause I, um, there was a question asked about if this, um, if the committee supports the resolve and the rule change as currently proposed, and it goes to the special appropriations table and um, the appropriations committee doesn't want to fund it at those levels. And I don't know, for some reason it just dies on the appropriations table. That would be technically failure of the legislature to act and when it comes to major substantive rules, uh, failure of the legislature to act means that the agency can move forward with the rule change as proposed. So it's quite, quite a pickle, um, <laughs> um, but that's technically what would happen. But uh, you know, I would hope that the appropriations committee and this committee would realize, okay, we need to adjust the numbers and you would work on that. But that's um, the, the technical, um, you know, uh, chain of events. So Representative Landry. Uh, a question for Julie Marie. You said the milk prices are up dramatically. <clears throat> Is that to the farmer or to, or retail or both? Both. Both, okay. So they are seeing some of the benefit of the increase. Yes, it will, it will go back to the farmers and it will put them in many cases um, above the uh, tier safety net prices. Therefore, really reducing the cost to us for some. Correct. Thank you. Representative Pluka. This is a follow-up for Karen. Uh, so if, if, the, if it goes, if the rule as currently written goes back to the department without any fund, additional funds being allocated, how do they pay for it? That's a good question. Karen, do you want me to address that? Yes, please. Um, the way the program is structured, there is a baseline um, al allocation, I think is the appropriate word, uh, every fiscal year. However, the program is, um, is authorized to request financial transfers depending on the financial need um, in any given month. And those funds come from the general fund or? They, they come from the general fund. All right. Okay, other questions? Senator Black. Um, question for Julie. And, and that's the way, I mean, we never know in every, any given year how much is gonna be used. I mean, you, 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 you milk tier prices are projected on 
the best guess, but scenarios, and correct me anytime I'm wrong, but anytime those could be way off. And so the appropriations committee really never knows what they're going to put in for money or not put in for money. Right. That, yep. am, I, am I correct? You are. Um, knowing what milk prices are going to be much more than, you know, two, three months out is a, a highly educated guessing game. Um, and so the, when the program was initiated, uh, the, the legislature took into account that there's a certain amount of instability in being able to predict the prices and they built flexibility into the program in order to maintain the safety nets. Mike Gold, do you want to respond to that? Uh, just, just a bit of a additional information. The transfer from the milk pool is reflected in the uh, revenue forecasting document. Uh, there's usually a brief description on page four of the introduction. And then in appendix A, uh, pages four through six, there's year by year fiscal estimates for what that transfer will be. And then in appendix G3, there's a printout of what the assumptions are for those documents, uh, those transfers. And that incorporates the information from the casinos because one of the casinos transfers a portion of revenue to offset the general fund transfer. Uh, so all that comes together in the revenue forecast, which happens twice a year, uh, always in December, alternating May and March. So it is adjusted pretty frequently. That's a line that every year, every time we do a revenue forecast does get either pushed up or pushed down to kind of reflect those changes as it moves forward. Senator Black, does that answer your question? You're muted, Senator Black. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, uh, Representative O'Neill, did you want to add something? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just was going to ask Karen how to articulate a motion to move it forward. Because I felt ready to do that. Um, so it would just be a straight ought to pass if you don't want to amend the rule. Okay, and that's what everybody wants, right? That uh, made the adjustment. Okay, so I make that motion, please. Uh, however, I will say that it will be, uh, if it, the committee report comes out, it will be ought to pass as amended with the fiscal note being the amendment. Understood, thanks. All right, so we have the motion from Representative O'Neill on LD 1805 to ought to pass as amended and the fiscal note is the amendment. Is there a second? I will second that. Representative Hall has seconded it. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Cheryl, will you call the roll please? Yes, I will. LD 1805 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Lori Osha. Absent. Representative Joseph Underwood. Absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Bill Kluker. I just want to be clear. This motion includes the increased rates we've been discussing, right? Yes. yes. This is 1805 and that's part of 1805 with tier one, 2305, 2144, 2093, and 2021. Great, I was just getting confused with Karen's explanation. Thank you, yes, I'm in favor. Uh, Representative Bill Pluger, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McCray, absent. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Eight, yes. Five absent. Okay, eight zero five. The resolve LD eighteen oh five passes. Is there anything else, Karen? 
Uh, not for this afternoon. Uh, you meet again at 11 on Thursday for four confirmation hearings. And I'm hoping chairs and leads can meet off of YouTube after this. Yep. Okay. Cheryl, anything else from you? No, nope. when you let me know, I'll turn off the live feed and we'll go into chairs and leads when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative O'Neill, anything from you? <coughs> nope. Good, thanks. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. Representative, Representative Landry followed by, seconded by Representative Pluker. All in favor, don't oppose. Thank you all. See you tomorrow, maybe. <laughs>